Great. Okay, you should be all set. Okay, so maybe I ought to do the introductions now. I am State Senator Mark Lawrence. I am the uh, chair, Senate chair of the um, Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. I represent Southern New York County, the towns of Kittery, Elliott, South Berwick, Half of Berwick, York, and Agunquit. And I'll go around virtual horseshoe and ask members to introduce themselves, starting with the House Chair of the Committee, uh, Representative Barry. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Seth Barry. I represent House District 55, Bowden, Bodenham, most of Richmond, and Swan Island on the Kennebec. And then we have um, Senator Stewart. Morning, folks. I'm Trey Stewart, State Senator in District 2, which is 51 communities in Riverside and Penobscot counties, and I reside in Presque Isle. Then we have Representative Cuddy. Good morning. My name is Scott Cuddy. I live in Winterport, and I represent House District 98, which is Winterport, Frankfort, Searsport, and Swanville. And then we have Representative Kessler. Good morning, my name is Chris Kessler and I represent part of South Portland and a little smidgen of Cape Elizabeth. Senator Vitelli. Good morning, everyone. I'm Senator Eloise Vitelli. I live in Araustic and represent District 23, which is all of Sagadahoc County and the town of Dresden in Lincoln County. Senator Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm actually Representative Foster, representing the towns of Dexter, Garland, Charleston, Exeter, and Stetson in House District 104. So are you sure you don't want to be a senator? I could just promote you at this point. Well, uh, I'll be down for the nighting, but no, I think I'm fine. <laughs> uh, Representative Wadsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. My name is Nate Wadsworth, and I represent House District, District 70, Southern Oxford County. Great. And we'll go from there to Representative Sachs. Good morning, everyone. My name is Melanie Sachs. I'm proud to represent House District 48, which is Freeport and part of Powell. Great. Representative Ziegler. Good morning, I'm Representative Paige Sigler from District 96 in Waldo County, seven towns of Belmont, Liberty, Lincolnville, Montville, Moore, Palermo, and Searsmont. And I will be toggling back between the ENR and the EUT committees as we finish up in ENR. And everybody's understood exactly what he said, the acronyms. Um, we'll go to Representative Grahowski. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nicole Grahowski. I represent House District 132, the fine people of the city of Ellsworth and the town of Trenton, and we're enjoying a little fresh snow this morning. Representative Cuddy. Representative Cuddy, I think he's switching back and forth between things, but I don't think that prevents us from getting a quorum. So I believe we're enough uh, to get started. We had a very long day uh, yesterday and people will be coming in and out frequently today. So all the uh, committees are trying to finish up on their work. Uh, but I'll first ask our analyst, uh, Lindsay Blackson to introduce herself. Good morning, my name is Lindsay Laxon. I am a legislative analyst with the Nonpartisan Office of Policy and Legal Analysis. And since we're also doing public hearings today, um, I'll ask um, our clerk, Jason, to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Jason, <clears throat> excuse me, Jason Ellerding, uh, the committee clerk for EUT. Okay. So we're gonna be doing uh, hopefully a variety of things today. We have, um, I believe it is um, six advertised uh, public hearings, pardon me, seven advertised public hearings today. I was getting confused because some say like LD 2016. So I thought it was uh, six years ago um, that this bill was introduced, but uh, we do have six bills, 
four of them, I believe four of them are the, I'm sorry, four of them are bills that were uh, still in our committee uh, for quite a while. And three of them are committee bills that we just uh, reported out. And, and, and um, to give ourselves, even if we didn't have enough work, even more work, um, we do have work, a lot of work left over. Uh, we have work sessions uh, yesterday. We have one bill left over from work session yesterday. And I'm going to suggest today that uh, when we get a bill, uh, one of the new bills, if we feel like we're ready to work it, just speak up, make a motion to go into work session, and, um, and then we can uh, work to get it done. So I'll just ask for a motion to go into work session now so we can uh, deal with what's left over from yesterday. So moved. Is there a motion? Moved by Senator Stewart. Is there a second? I'm second. Okay, there's a second. Show of hands, all those in favor of going into work session. One, two, three. May, may I pose a question to the chair? Yeah, I'm having a little bit of trouble. Six, going into work session. Did I miss Senator Vitelli? You can lower your hands now. Senator Lawrence. Yes. Uh, 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 just a point of order. Um, which bill is it that we're voting to go into work session on? It's the one we were working on 634 and uh, we were waiting for an amendment to come back uh, that represented uh, that. Excuse me. I demoted him this time. Uh, Senator Stewart was going to be offering to that. Um, and if you recall, during the work session, he was going to get that back later in the day. I think it came in too late yesterday for us to deal with it yesterday. So we're going to be working on that one. I see. So I'll ask for a hands of those opposed. One opposed to going into work session on LD 634. Yeah, opposed to going into work session. Once we go into work session, we can work anything. Two. Thank you. Okay, so the motion prevails. Um, we're in work session and Senator Stewart, did you, you got your amendment back from the governor's energy office, is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chair, that is correct. And uh, okay. I'm not sure if Lindsay shared it with the entire committee yesterday or not, um, but it is uh, publicly available at this point. So uh, Lindsay, do you have that uh, amendment available to bring up on the screen? Um, I have the language that was shared um, from the governor's energy office. I'd be happy to bring okay. that up on the screen. That would be great to get us started. And, and Mr. Chair, I might ask that the a representative from the governor's energy office um, perhaps come in to walk through what the okay. amendment is. So Jason, is Dan Burgess in the waiting room? Uh, yes, he is. I'll uh, okay. just- Why don't you bring him over? There he should be on his way. Okay, great. So, Lindsay, would it be okay with you to, for me just to go directly to Mr. Burgess to um, talk about this amendment? That would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, Chair Lawrence, members of the committee. Would you like me to Great. proceed? Yes, if you could just introduce yourself and then uh, proceed to describe the amendment that was prepared. Great. So, I'm Dan Burgess. I'm director of the Governor's Energy Office. I am. Um, uh, thanks for having me on. If, if at all possible, it'd be great to have Melissa Winnie and Ethan Tremblay from my team also zoomed over um, in case there are uh, other additional questions that need to be answered. I um, believe we have the technology. So uh, Jason, can you zoom them over? Go ahead, Dan. Great, so this uh, uh, amendment seeks to modify or does modify um, a portion of the net energy billing program called the, which is the tariff rate portion of the program. Um, uh, as set up currently, the tariff rate is set annually by the Public Utilities Commission and generally follows the um, uh, retail rate of energy. So it's this, the uh, supply that comes in and then 75% of T and D. And so a, a rate is set each year um, uh, for, for projects that have qualified for the NEB uh, tariff program. This is different. There is also the credit program. So the, 
the credit program provides a credit uh, directly onto a subscriber or off takers bill, whereas the tariff program provides that direct financial payment. And I have a couple slides I can try to help level set here, but ultimately what this amendment does is sets a forward looking date of September 1st to modify that rate. Um, so what the proposal here is that if a project has not uh, uh, commenced uh, a significant amount of work as defined by uh, actually by the IRS definition that's used around tax credits for the IRS, that if they have not done that by September 1st of this year, and instead of going from that rate that changes each year, that we would simply lock in the rate from when the, the program first passed or was first created, the 2020 rate. So as, we, as this committee well knows, uh, standard offer prices uh, went up pretty significantly this, this last or this year. Um, seeing that, felt like it was prudent to make an adjustment to this, uh, this tariff rate program. Um, so that is the general uh, crux of the, of the amendment. Um, we are suggesting that for projects that are less than a megawatt and uh, or um, uh, co-located with load, you know, more traditionally next to load or with load that they continue to operate at that more traditional energy billing of, of that uh, rate that's there now. So it would change, be a pros prospective change for projects to receive a, um, a rate that is uh, locked in at the 2020 rate. And I have a couple slides I'm happy to, happy to Happy to run through if that's helpful too, to just kind of level set a little bit. That sounds good, Dan, if you could do that. Great, so I will attempt to share my screen. Assuming you can see that, Chairman Lawrence, I see Representative Cuddy has a question. Do you want me to take that now or yes. go through this first? Why don't we go through your presentation first and then we'll get to uh, Representative Cuddy um, when we go for questions for you. It's not actually a presentation question, Senator. Oh, okay, what's your question? Um, the, the has the amendment been emailed out? I'm not seeing it if it has been. Lindsay, did the amendment get emailed out? No, it did not. I'd be happy to forward the email with the GEO's language to the committee right now, if you'd like. Why don't you do that? Can do. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Cuddy. Um, Dan, why don't you go ahead with your slide presentation? Thanks. And just a, a few slides. I think it's just um, I thought it was helpful again to, to go through it. So the uh, this slide shows how much is eligible in uh, energy billing, as, as this committee well knows, uh, LD 936 last year uh, um, uh, basically capped the program for new uh, projects up to five megawatts. There are still projects under two megawatts that can participate, but the predominant number of projects are, you know, closer to that 4.99 um, um, rate. So there's about 1,300 megawatts of solar that's currently eligible for net energy billing. That is this chart here broken down by uh, their, their status as of the end of the year. What we're, we're talking about is about 65% of the program. So 65% of the projects eligible for net energy billing now are in the tariff program. Um, this blue kilowatt hour program is that crediting program that we've, that we've talked about. So what's happened on the, uh, uh, and these are actually, this, this tariff program is just for commercial and industrial um, customers. So these, what we've seen is that these CNI tariff rates have increased over time and have been uh, uh, volatile, volatile. And um, I think uh, have gone from 13 cents uh, again around 2020 to about 19 cents. And you can see that broken down by the customer type here, the, blue being what they were in 2020, orange being 2021, and gray being um, this year. So these are rates that are set as required uh, by the PUC. I'll note that 2021 was you know, uh, a very low year um, across uh, energy supply or, particular, or here in Maine as a result of the pandemic. Um, and so uh, that, that orange bar is a you know, historically low year for, for, for energy prices. And so this proposal would seek to set, um, uh, uh, instead of having this fluctuate every year, it would uh, use the 2020 rate um, as the rate that uh, projects are, 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 could receive on a forward-looking basis. And if you just look at kind of why are these prices going up, um, you know, more than half of the reason, and, and for some of these rates, uh, the reason they're going up is because of the, the, the standard offer um, increases. And so uh, after talking with numerous stakeholders, uh, PUC, OPA, and others felt like this was a, um, a way to 
really reduce risk in the um, in the program. Um, you know, uh, companies and developers have to kind of look out 20 years to see what they think you know the uh, energy curve is going to look like, and therefore uh, build in risk into their their proposals. And I think by providing the certainty, it can uh, uh, reduce the risk for projects, but ultimately uh, can save ratepayers money as as uh, uh, we wouldn't be paying that kind of higher swing in prices and would be locking it at, at where this program started at the at the 2020 rate. So we're expecting, you know, this is in line, I think, with what we've seen uh, distributed generation be paid in, in other states in New England. Um, and I think we're expecting as a result of this program that, you know, the, the percent savings could be um, pretty significant if you look at what, um, um, if you kind of based on what the last 10 years have looked like, and look at what the next 10 years could look like. We're looking at, you know, 30% uh, uh, savings to even as high as 60% savings, depending on uh, depending on it. So that is the overview of the amendment and slides. And then I'm happy to take uh, happy to take any questions. I appreciate the time. Great, Dan. Before we go to questions, I just have a couple of procedural things to ask you. Now, I recall back when we first started this session, both you and Bill Harwood, I believe, and I think the um, the PUC also reported to our committee about this issue and began talking about this. This was what you reported at the start of the session about potentially freezing the standard rate offer. Is that correct? Yes, or yes, with the, the tariff part of the program. And how long have you been working on this language? Oh, um, at least since um, started to be discussions when the standard offer price went up and this um, became a little more evident. Um, so at least a few months. And who have you talked to and who have you brought into this conversation and drafting this? We've had uh, conversations and I don't, I don't want to um, 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 speak for them, but I think productive conversations with the PUC, the OPA, uh, members of the renewable, ener renewable energy industry. So MREA, the Community Shared Solar Association, I'm getting that, uh, that acronym wrong. Um, we've had some, some discussions with uh, representatives from um, IECG, I think there's a uh, uh, general comfort level with this proposal. Some would say maybe it goes a little far. Some would say it uh, doesn't go far enough. Um, but I think ultimately is a um, is a way to uh, move this program forward at a reduced cost. Great, thank you. Um, and then Lindsay, my understanding is that Representative Barry has also submitted this legislation as part of one of his bills. This amendment is part of one of his bills. That's correct. Okay, so, and what's that LD number? That is, I believe, 1026, which is also scheduled for public hearing this morning. Right, so uh, I'll just direct committee members um, to testimony that was uh, submitted on Representative Barry's bill. You should have that for comments from people on this legislation. Um, Senator Stewart did indicate yesterday that he was gonna be offering this amendment Amendment to his amendment to his amendment to his bill, and uh, we'll see what happens on this bill. Um, so I'll go to the committee you to look at the uh, submitted testimony on um, Representative Barry's bill. Questions for Director Burgess? Yes, Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It must be cold in Berwick. Uh, you seem to be freezing up occasionally. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask the question, uh, 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 Mr. Burgess. I, I'm wondering if you could uh, uh, explain just a little bit the IRS definition that you mentioned earlier about where these projects are to qualify uh, for this. Thank you. Thanks, Representative Foster. Um, so the language that is in um, the Amendment of Section Five um, begins at uh, if the entity developing the DG resource certifies by sworn affidavit with accompanying documentation to the Commission that the entity has commenced physical work of a significant nature before September 122, and thereafter has made and will continue to make continuous efforts to advance toward completion of the facility. 
um, including, and there's a few different things uh, around um, the actual work that would happen for, for commencing construction. So that, that comes directly after conversations with, with some in the industry around uh, the IRS de definition around what qualifies for the production tax credit or the um, investment tax credit that the federal government offers. So it's a, a well-known um, standard, which I think the industry is um, um, used to complying with. Um, and uh, really what it seeks to do is set a um, marker of when a, a project has moved forward substantially, right? We've, we've heard, um, you know, companies have signed uh, construction contracts or, or are commencing construction as soon, you know, they've, they've, they've paid money to, to, to start these projects now for this upcoming construction season. And so we um, use the definition to look at a, at a future date to say, okay, if um, let's use the IRS definition that has worked um, to outline what commence construction really means. Are you if all I saying this? If I go may, ahead, Representative Foster. Thank you, uh, Mr. Burgess. So uh, when I look at this amendment down in section two, uh, it changes the proposed distri distributed generation resource must reach. Originally, the language for net energy billing was commercial operation. It's changing that to mechanical completion. Do you see that as, as uh, the, that would might substantially increase how many net energy, energy billing projects might come into play here? Yeah, thanks, Representative Foster, for, for uh, asking that. Um, I did not mean to skip over that part. So what, what we heard and, and have heard throughout the, our um, engagement is that um, commercial operation requires, uh, you know, just to use layman terms, you know, the, the, the switch to be flipped for a project, right? And um, felt like and what is, is, is done in, in other states is the term mechanical completion is used or mechanically complete um, so that it removes any contingency where a project is fully complete, but simply waiting for it to be turned on. And so um, there may be, you know, reasons either at the utility or, or, or otherwise that um, would, would keep it from, you know, actually being energized. And uh, I feel like this definition is a standard practice and kind of gets at what was, what was in, intended. So we don't have projects that are built uh, prior to the date and just uh, waiting to be energized. Um, that was the intent. So if I may, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Representative Foster. So more to the point of my question, it may in fact increase how many net NG billing projects would, would come into play versus the current language. Uh, thanks, Representative. My sense is not, um, I don't think so. I think it is more of a, uh, I think it would, I, I do not envision uh, a, a solar company building a project just to get to mechanically complete. Sorry, I'm home with a, a sick four-year-old. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask Melissa and Ethan to weigh in for a second. I'll be right back. Yeah, good. We've all been there, uh, Director Burgess. As the committee knows, I have occasional dog, uh, a visit from our dog. I'm good with that, uh, Mr. Chair, if you want to move on. Oh, okay. Well, I believe Representative Barry has a question for Mr. Burgess, so I'll wait till he gets back. Actually, my question is for the chair. Okay, go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, Senator Lawrence, I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions about the uh, plans for today and um, just want to know what to tell people. Um, is it your intention uh, as the Senate chair that after the work session on this bill that we would go to the advertised order for public hearings? Correct. Correct. If you recall, yesterday we worked this bill. Um, we asked uh, Director Burgess to come back with language in the afternoon. We were going to go back and revisit the bill. I wasn't there in the afternoon in the work session. I don't know why that wasn't done, but because it wasn't done, Senator Stewart indicated he wanted to offer this amendment um, to his legislation. So I don't want to deny him that opportunity. So that's why we're completing this, which should have been done yesterday afternoon. We're completing this this morning and then going into public hearings. Thanks, Senator. Um, I was actually ready to vote on 
uh, this bill yesterday, and I think there was actually an effort to do that. Um, but okay. the motion was to table it. I, um, uh, so just to be clear, um, the advertised order is as reflected on the weekly schedule. Is that correct? That's the order um, yeah. we'll be hearing and, and, and I haven't had a request to go out of that order. Great. And Are you making a request to go out of order? No, I just want to make sure that uh, the public is aware. So that would be uh, LD 318, um, which I believe is your bill, pertains to the Efficiency Main Trust, then uh, LD 337. Oh, excuse me. No, the well, LD 318, I, I, can just, I can just present the order, Representative Barry, okay, so, so you know. So we're going to be, after this work session, we're going to be doing the public hearings on 318, 337, um, 1026. 15, 11, 2015, 2016, and 2017, unless I get a request to change the order. That they're just, we have to slam through everything we can to get it done. We have a deadline by this Friday. So we'll try to meet your requests on timing and everything. But um, our priority is we just have to get things done. So the normal you know, accommodations we could do is probably limited. Um, and on public hearings, this committee has a tendency to go a long time. So if we have to go into this evening, um, we will to complete all the public hearings and all the questions involved. Thank you. Thank you. And one last question for you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Representative the, Barry. Um, this is, consider this a request. Um, uh, I'm the, I'll be presenting five of the bills. Three of them are committee bills. Um, but uh, I am very happy to uh, put those last so that uh, those who are presenting other bills have the opportunity to um, have the public while they're fresh. Um, so that would be sticking to the advertised order. And uh, just wanna you know, make that request now um, in deference to those of you that, that um, have other bills. And um, I just right. wanna make sure that public, most importantly, the public knows roughly when their bill might come up. Yeah. And, and I do apologize to the public. We don't have the ability at this late in the session with a lot of these bills to try to accommodate people's schedules to be on when they are. And if you are uh, intending to testify on a public hearing, um, you do have the ability to submit written testimony. We do read that written testimony. So if you're not able to be, be here because the variations in our schedules uh, that is going to take place for the rest of the week, please do submit written testimony. Thank you, Representative Barry. Now back to Director Burgess. Are there questions for Director Burgess regarding this amendment? And I hope everything worked out with your son, uh, Director Burgess. Thanks, Chairman Lawrence. Uh, my my five-year-old daughter, we're, we're oh, keeping geez. Disney Plus in uh, in in business today, so thanks. Well, I can try that with Skeet, who's annoying me here now, but he usually likes the animal planet. So if there are no other questions, are there, I wanna make sure, are there any other questions for Director Burgess? Did you have anybody else on your office who wanted to weigh in, uh, Dan? I think we're good, thank you. Okay, okay, we can go um, to, I know there are a number of people who have submitted written testimony on Representative Barry's bill. Um, is there anybody uh, who the committee wants to hear from uh, on this amendment before we have a motion um, who uh, may be in the attendees list? Representative Foster. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I haven't had a chance to look, but I would be interested in hearing from the Public Advocates Office on this if, if we could. I have so the request that... is from the public. Have William Harwood in the waiting room, Jason. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So you you want uh, you you froze again. So um, you you want the PUC and uh, William nope, Harwood. I want William William Harwood. William Harwood. My my. Okay. Okay, he should be right over.
Can you hear me? Yep, I can. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Bill. Yes, uh, we really appreciate the efforts of the governor's energy office on this. I think they have done a, a good job of trying to balance the legitimate investment expectations of solar developers with the uh, desire of ratepayer advocates to reduce the overall ratepayer cost of this program. Uh, I would have loved to have seen that September 1st date moved a little earlier. I worry that there may be some uh, gaming of the situation, but I uh, uh, respect the work that uh, Director Burgess did and uh, our office is in full support of this uh, proposal. Thank you. Um, questions for Mr. Harwood? Representative Foster. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Public Advocate Harwood, for being here. Uh, when I look at testimony on this, the original bill, uh, I, I found that the your predecessor was opposed to it. Uh, from what you've just said, it sounds like you may be in favor of it. Uh, and, and so that would be part of my question. And the last part would be, do you see, for instance, in the change in language uh, from commercial operation to mechanical completion or any other language, any concern that this may actually increase uh, net energy billing besides the date change that you just mentioned? Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 as I say, I have great respect for Director Burgess, but I have to concede that there is a theoretical possibility that a few more projects might slip through based on mechanical completion uh, versus commercial operation. But as he said, I think it's a very small number. And if this was the concession that was made to the industry in order to get them to be comfortable with the first part of the bill, I I'm comfortable as well. Thank you. Any other questions for the public advocate? Is there anyone else the committee members want to pose a question to? Just raise your hand. Since nobody is, I would like to hear from, I know Director Burgess said he worked with some of the organizations and I believe, do we have um, uh, Caitlin Kelly O'Neill in the waiting room, Jason? Yes. Okay. If you can bring her over, I, I would like to hear how the Coalition for Community Solar kind of views this uh, amendment. Okay, she should be right over. And if you could also uh, bring over Jeremy Payne too, if he's in the waiting room, I would like to hear from him. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Senator Lawrence. Thank you, Representative Barry. Um, officially, CCSA is testifying as neither for nor against the bill, um, but we do appreciate the work that was done by Director Burgess and the Governor's Energy Office. Um, you know, as everybody knows, the standard offer rate um, was historically high this past year because of supply issues with natural gas. And because of the way the net energy billing tariff value is calculated, um, and it's directly tied to that standard offer rate, 2020 did see unexpectedly high values for the NEP tariff rate. And so we completely understand the, the, the need and the desire to implement a reasonable cost containment measure for the NEB tariff program. Um, we think that this language balances implementing a cost containment measure so that future program costs aren't tied to these, you know, frankly historic uh, energy market fluctuations that we've seen in the past couple of years, um, while also balancing uh, projects that have as Director Burgess was saying, are commencing construction, meaning they've closed financing, their work is underway. Um, and so changing the structure of how they are receiving revenue at that point in time uh, is extremely challenging. So ensuring that those projects are able to continue to move forward and do work this summer without having to worry about their changing revenue structure um, while also allowing other projects to 
have this fixed tariff rate, um, we find to be a completely reasonable compromise. Um, and regarding the mechanical completion language, frankly, uh, we, we don't really see this as increasing the cost of the program. Um, this is primarily going to save the utilities, save um, the PUC, and, and save developers a lot of headache at the end of 2024 when we reach that deadline. Um, you know, with mechanical completion, the project is constructed, they've done the work, you know, they wouldn't commence construction unless they were fully sure that they could move forward. And also, that means that they have met the previous safe harbor requirements passed in LD 936. So really, what this is allowing is, it gives the utilities um, some extra time to complete the necessary construction on their side of the meter. Um, which they have to do before they can give, um, tell that project that they can flip the switch and become commercially operational. Um, we actually would encourage um, and maybe even more, uh, um, more extension on that um, for projects that are coming out of cluster studies and the utility is giving five to seven year construction schedules um, to complete work so that they don't have to build the project and have it you know, have it wait another couple of years before they could be turned on. Um, but beyond that, uh, we are appreciative of that. So happy to take any questions. Great. Are there any questions from the committee? I don't think you, I don't see any. Thank you for uh, uh, giving us your, your position on it. And Jeremy Payne, Jeremy. I'll ask you the same question. Um, you know, I know your organization has been consulted on this this amendment. Now that you see the official language, is there anything additional you want us to know? Uh, good morning, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee, Jeremy Payne with Maine Renewable Energy Association. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, I, I won't repeat the things that you just heard from from Caitlin. I think. One of the points I'd like to just make is in regard to one of the questions that Representative Foster was asking and Mr. Harwood was responding to regarding this, this change between commercial operation to mechanical completion. I think the reality is without that, what we're going to see is projects that are literally built, sitting there waiting for the thumbs up from CMP or Versant, and they may die uh, because they won't reach commercial operation through no fault of their own. Um, so I, I think that would be a really, really bad outcome for us to tell people invest here. They pay contractors to, to build their project. They have it up and running. And the only thing standing in their way of being eligible for the NEB 1.0 program is the fact that the utility has a bunch of these before them and it's taking them too long to respond. So that's why we think the mechanical operation, I, I just don't think the narrative that we're allowing you know, more projects to sneak in is accurate. We're not creating some sort of loophole. We're saying you have made significant investment, you're ready to go. And the only thing you're waiting for is CMP or Versant to tell you yes. Um, and then uh, just one other, two other quick points I wanted to make. You know, we had talked last year about expecting somewhere around 50% attrition that projects would fall apart for one reason or another. W based on the uh, initial results from some of these cluster studies, we think those results, those attrition rates are going to be way higher. Um, not only are there, as you heard Caitlin just say, some circumstances where there's going to be five or seven years of delay for utilities to do these upgrades. Um, there's, there's lots of other factors that are impacting these projects. So I think we're going to end up seeing between the delays and the costs of some of these upgrades that are coming back, we're going to see attrition rates that are looking at 70 or 80%. Now, I know there are some people who prefer that outcome, um, but I just wanted to put that information out there. We were, we were estimating 50% and we're thinking it's going to be way, way higher based on these initial results. And then the, the last thing I just wanted to mention is that it is really my hope this is going to be the final modification to the NEB DG 1.0 policy. Uh, I mean, as this committee knows, we've already got a DG 2.0 group that's working on bringing some ideas and concepts for your consideration next session, but we cannot keep going backward on this program and saying, golly, we wish we would have done X, we wish we would have done Y. We have sent a signal to the marketplace to invest in these projects. They have negotiated deals with residential subscribers, commercial and institutional off-takers. They need to know that we're gonna be protecting their investment and we're not gonna continue changing the way their revenues and the, uh, the policies are structured behind them. So. Um, I would just recommend that anything else you consider uh, is done prospectively only and does not implicate any existing projects. 
Thank you. Be happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you. Other questions from the committee for Jeremy? Seeing none, Jeremy, I, I just want to remind you or, or let you know that when I first served in the legislature, somebody told me that neither neither human nor beast is safe while the legislature is in session. So it's my effort to get us out of session as quickly as we can by finishing up our work. But we'll we appreciate your comment. Is there anyone else that the uh, Danny, so I'll go to Senator Stewart. I'm sorry, Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It must be something. I put my hand up and you lock up. So uh, must be something going on there. If I could, I have one quick question for the PUC, someone from the PUC. Okay. Thank you. Do we have someone there? Jason, do we have anybody from the PUC? Yeah, we have. We have Deirdre. Uh, okay, and I apologize. I'm going to try to move to a different location in my house to see. On and off, and my uh, video is freezing. If I may, while you're doing that, Mr. Chair, I will ask my question of the PUC. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Schneider. Uh, I'm just wondering, the PUC has had a chance, I hope, to look at this amendment uh, language. I'm wondering if, uh, first of all, if they are okay with it, if they see any issues, or if you, uh, uh, would, would you uh, tend to agree that overall, this may avoid some costs to ratepayers in the future, if not save them anything now? Thank you. Thank you, Representative Foster. I'm Deirdre Schneider, the legislative liaison at the PUC. Uh, we do think that this would um, reduce some potential volatility in pricing and maybe limit ratepayers' exposure to higher supply rates. Um, so I think we're comfortable with that aspect. We did point out in our testimony to LD 1026 that we would maybe like some clarity regarding the expectations of the commission related to the receipt of a sworn affidavit. Um, it's unclear from the language if the commission is to simply receive these affidavits from the entity developing the distributed generation resource, or if the commission is required to confirm the information is accurate and that all requirements are met or will be met. Um, the language in the bill isn't clear about our role, if we're just a receiver or if we're to actually have some oversight. And then we also thought, regardless of whether we are to just receive those affidavits or confirm its accuracy, um, if the committee could consider um, clarity about what is meant by physical work of a significant nature, um, maybe what that threshold would be. So those were our only two concerns with the language, but to your earlier part of your question, I mean, we do think it overall could have some ratepayer benefits. If I may, Mr. Chair. Go uh, ahead, Representative Foster. Thank you, Ms. Schneider. So does the PUC have uh, a pro proposed language that would clarify that, or is that something that the committee could do in language review if this bill passed, or, or how do you see that? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we were, we were wanting to know what the intent was, so we didn't come up with language. We didn't want to say that we need to just receive them or to review them. Um, so if, they, if the committee would like us to have some oversight on that process, then we would welcome amended language to say, you know, that we received this sworn affidavit and confirm the information is accurate or something along those lines. And, and again, we don't know what was intended in the conversations of physical work of a significant nature. I mean, I think we could determine that on a case by case basis if we were to have some oversight, but maybe just to reference that, you know, as determined by the commission, if, if that's the direction the committee would like to go into. Thank you. Senator Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks to your drift for being here. So um, in the GEO's um, sort of explanation earlier today, they talked about um, using the IRS's definition of work of a significant nature. Um, is that sufficient from your vantage point to give you direction um, in terms of reviewing those affidavits and confirming whether or not work of a significant nature has been done based on what's been provided? I would have to see the definition, but I think it would be helpful to at least reference it in 35A. So there's an expectation or a knowledge of what the expectation is and not an assumption that we're using this IRS definition without referencing maybe what that means. 
So if I may, Mr. Chair. Yes. So, so if we pointed to that definition in this bill's language, that would be sufficient to give you folks the clarity that you need? I, I believe so. I mean, I haven't seen the definition, so I don't want to say it unequivocally, but I mean, I think any idea of what it was intended is always helpful. Any other questions for Ms. Schneider? Great. Is there anybody else uh, committee members want to hear from before we have a motion? Senator Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, just one last quick follow up for um, um, the PUC. If I, oh, did we just lose her? We may have just lost her. <laughs> Shoot. Jason, can you bring Deirdre back over, please? Yes, I'm bringing her right back. So, sorry about that, Deirdre. Um, so one last question. Um, in confirming some of that language in the affidavit, would it be all right if that information was shared with the utilities to confirm that, that, that that's actually taken place? Does that, make, does that question make sense to you? Meaning if once we receive the affidavit, we confirm with the utility that that information is accurate. Right, right. I think that would work. I, I would like to just you know double check with the folks that actually do this on a daily basis to make sure um, that that is workable. And I, you know, if, if I could probably do that pretty quickly, but if you wanted to just vote now and I can confirm if there's a change that needs to be made during language review, that's an option I would assume. Okay. Any other questions uh, for Ms. Schneider before we beam her back on the other side? Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else uh, committee members wanna hear from before we move to a motion and debate and discussion on this amendment? Okay, I'll recognize um, Senator Stewart for the purposes of making a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd move ought to pass as amended uh, provided the um, language that I, Lindsay, just nod if, if, if um, you have the language from the governor's energy office in there. And I think um, I'll incorporate into that um, directly pointing to the um, IRS definition uh, of um, work of a substantial nature. I think if, if that makes sense, just keep, keep nodding if, <laughs> if that makes sense. Okay, great. Um, and, and as well as clarifying in there, if it's helpful for the PUC, um, that they can, once they've received those affidavits, they can confirm with the, the utilities as well. Okay, Senator uh, Stewart has made a motion. Is there a second? Uh, second, second that we just, I need a voice. I can't do it with a hand. Representative Wadsworth, that. I'm sorry, Rep. Representative Wadsworth, were you seconding? Whoops, I'll go to Representative Foster. Were you, uh, Representative Wadsworth, back to you. Were you seconding? Yes, I was. Okay, seconded by, and I apologize because some people listen to this on audio. So we can't, uh, I can't, you know, simply have a shake of the head or raise the hand to do that. Um, so it's been moved by Senator Stewart, seconded by Representative Wadsworth. Uh, debater discussion? Okay, I'm, I'll chime in. I'm very comfortable with this. I think it's a good resolution um, to a situation we've known about for quite a time, trying to figure out. I appreciate the GEO and uh, Mr. Harwood and everybody working so hard on this. And I really appreciate the members of the solar community and in, in weighing in on their thoughts too as well. Um, compromising these things out is never easy. It's never an easy way to uh, resolve things. And we never know how something, especially new like this is gonna work, but, uh, but I'm gonna be voting in favor. I think this is a very good resolution. Any other debate or discussion? Okay, Jason, why don't you call the roll? Senator Lawrence? Yes. Senator Lawrence is a yes. Senator Vitelli? 
Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart? Yes. Senator Stewart is a yes. Representative Barry? Representative Barry is not present. Representative Cuddy? Not present. Representative Grahowski? Not present. Representative Kessler? Not present. Representative Ziegler? Yes. Representative Ziegler is a yes. Representative Sachs? Not present. Representative Wadsworth? Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Representative Grignon? Not present. Representative Foster? Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. Representative Carlo? Not present. That would be six voting in favor and seven not present. And I thought I heard Representative Grohowski there for a second. Um, Nicole, are you there? Did you want to be recorded on the vote? Uh, and Seth, you're not there, and Representative Kessler is not there. Okay. So, Jason, the vote is six to zero. Seven members being absent. Um, so, refresh my memory. Do you remember, Lindsay, if we had a quorum when we started? Um, does it prevent us from... Um, I don't think it prevents us from voting and allows those people who couldn't be here because they had to go to something else from voting when they come back. Is that correct? I would have to check on that. Um, quorum is seven, but I don't know if you had quorum when you started. Um, so I'd have we to check. did. We did because we had a vote on going into work session and there was a quorum at that time. So the vote is six to zero and ought to pass as amended. And we'll give a chance for members to come back and vote and we'll check on that uh, rule um, as we go along. I'm gonna try to get back into the other room to um, check on um, uh, the list of the people who are testifying. But I believe the first bill we have is Representative Grohowski's bill to um, go into public hearing on. And I don't know if Representative Grohowski is back. Nope, she is not. So we'll skip over that. We'll wait till she gets back. The uh, second bill we have is my bill, which is the omnibus bill, an act regarding energy utilities and technology. Um, and um, this is a bill as I, uh, we'll start on the public hearing. So if I could just ask um, Senator Vitelli to chair. And I guess maybe if we only have uh, six here now, I'm gonna have to put the committee at ease and um, see if we can get a quorum here. Um, so actually we can start our public hearings. So let's put it ease if you could um, uh, silence your uh, audio and, and your um, video and we'll take a brief break. We'll be back in uh, 15 minutes at 1020 to try to start our public hearings.
This is called herding cats. Yes, it is. It's always so busy towards the end of committee. Yep. Everybody's running around. Okay, and if everybody could just please turn their video back on, we're ready to get started again. So I'm just trying to visually concern, confirm who is here. We have one, two, three, four, five. I'll wait for the others to come back. Um, and I did uh, talk to the, um, to the Secretary of the Senate about rules. And he said, yeah, one of the, it's difficult on Zoom because when you start the vote, you know, you may see all the people there, but unless you have seven people who are visually on, you can't complete the vote. So we're still at the vote, we're still in work session and we need to get seven people on so we can complete this roll call. So I'm counting one, two, three, four, I may five. Have one more. I may have one more, Mr. Chair. Six. Okay, thank you. And I appreciate everybody's patience. This is a very difficult time in the session and we're all pulled in so many different directions. So we just need to complete this vote and then hopefully Representative Ziegler, uh, Representative, not Ziegler, Representative Grohowski will be with us so we can begin go into public hearing and begin uh, the hearing on our bill. Mr. Chair, is, is Representative Cuddy there? He said he was coming back. He said he was in the middle of another hearing and so was Representative Sachs. There's, there's your seven. Uh, yes, and um, up oh, there, Representative Cuddy, thank you very much. You're welcome. We now have a quorum and, and I'll have, I'll repeat the motion. The motion on the floor is uh, the motion of uh, Senator Stewart on ought to pass as amended. This is the uh, NEB proposal, the changes to NEB. And he did amend his motion from what appeared on the screen to include the two requests that the PUC made regarding a clearer definition of, um, of what substantial work was and, and a little bit more on the process on how they uh, get the information. So if we're ready, um, we can go through the roll call again. Jason, do you want to call the roll? Okay. Uh, Senator Lawrence. Yes. Senator Lawrence is a yes. Senator Vitelli. Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart. Yes. Senator Stewart is a yes. Representative Barry. Not present. Representative Cuddy. Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski. Not present. Representative Kessler, not present. Representative Ziegler, not present. Representative Sachs, not present. Representative Wadsworth. Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Representative Grignon, not present. Representative Foster. Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. Representative Carlo? Yes. Representative Carlo is a yes. That's seven in favor of the motion and six not present. Okay. So thank you. Seven being in favor of the motion and six being present. It's going to be a majority report on the ought to pass as amended. We'll have to wait and see when the other votes show up, um, you know, what their votes are going to be recorded as. And I'd ask if somebody on the committee could text Representative Grohowski to see if she's available to present her bill. Um, so we'll uh, have completed our work session. We can now go into public hearing. Um, and unfortunately, I know Representative Barry had wanted me to take them in order, but because Representative Grohowski isn't here, I'm gonna have to take them out of order. So I'll go to first uh, my bill and I'll ask 
Senator Vitelli, if you would chair so I can present my bill. I will certainly do my best, Senator Lawrence. Um, so we will now open a public hearing on LD337. And I will call on Senator Lawrence to present his legislation to us. Thank you very much. And if you recall, um, if you recall, uh, this is the omnibus bill that I uh, brought in earlier in the session to give us a vehicle if we wanted to do anything at the very end of the session, and we needed a, a piece of legislation to do it. It's called an act regarding utilities, technology, energy, utilities, and technology. And I was approached by Michael Stoddard, who from the Efficiency Main Trust, who has um, some technical changes he wanted to do with the Green Bank. And he has those, I believe, Lindsay, that has been emailed out to the committee. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. That's been emailed out to the committee. Um, and um, I defer any questions to him. I did ask him to check with Representative Ziegler and Senator Kerry, uh, excuse me, Carney, because I know they were very involved in the Green Bill. Um, but uh, with that, I'll just hopefully defer any questions uh, to Mr. Stoddard. Thank you, Senator Lawrence. Um, we will now ask to bring Michael Stoddard over. So if any members of the committee have questions. Sorry, Senator, are, are, are there any questions for me? Oh, I'm sorry. Just I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> Trying to save us some time here, Senator. I understand. Are I'm there any kidding. questions for Senator Lawrence before we pose them to Michael Stoddard? Seeing none, Senator. Are there questions from, for, from the committee for Michael Stoddard, who is now with us? Uh, good morning, Senator. Um, maybe I could just do a, a brief introduction and that would help uh, because I recognize that this is all uh, piling into your inbox um, at, at very late notice. And, and I have a bit of an explanation for that as well. So perhaps I could just lay it out quickly. And then uh, if that helps prompt people or guide their questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Senator, Stoddard. good morning. My name is Michael Stoddard. I am the executive director of the Efficiency Main Trust. And I, I am uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of LD337 as amended with the language that was circulated yesterday. Um, the explanation for why this is coming now is, is, uh, is actually fairly straightforward. A year ago, your committee passed and then the full legislature enacted two pieces of legislation that proposed to expand and build out a bit the trust's authority to provide financing to main consumers who were engaging in some kind of an energy efficiency or clean energy project. The ones you have heard us talk about in the past, heat pumps, weatherizing homes, uh, providing new HVAC systems or refrigeration systems in their buildings, uh, et cetera. And those two uh, programs, one was called CPACE or commercial PACE loans, and the other was called the Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator, which also sometimes goes by the name of a green bank. And that was Representative Ziegler's bill. Both were enacted a year ago, and since that time, our staff has been working with some attorneys and with experts in other states and talking to our sister agencies in state government to better understand what is needed and what we should be focusing on, and also how would we go about doing it. And in the process of doing that research and having those conversations, and as we've been getting closer and closer to uh, settling on a handful of loan programs that we would like to start offering this year, we have received some questions from people asking if we really have clear authority to take some of those steps, to perform some of those operations. And as it may not surprise you to learn, um, some of the provisions that were enacted last year um, are at a pretty high level. They're in some cases a, a bit general and vague. And as you might also imagine the finance industry doesn't really love, they don't love that. <laughs> they like specificity and clarity. And so 
Uh, I realized that we had a very, very brief window of opportunity here to try and add a few technical definitions to our statute and also clarify in writing some authority, which generally I would argue our trust already has, and in some cases is already exercising, but is not written down clearly. And so I asked uh, Chairman Lawrence if he would agree to use this vehicle to create some of that clarity in, in the statute so that if, for example, hypothetically, in the future, we were to try to capitalize a loan program with a bond with bond money from fame, the bond market would be able to look to the statute and see very clearly that we did have the authority to take a security interest in a loan. We did have the up, uh, authority to dispose of property if, if we needed to. Um, a lot of these are, are contingencies and eventualities that may never happen, but if you don't have them in writing, then the lenders uh, and, and the bond markets can't be sure that you could actually dispose of it and, and they will then charge more uh, on their funds because there's uncertainty and they don't like uncertainty. So that's the gist of what we're asking for. Um, and I will also add that you'll see some, um, some language uh, about basic uh, authority or act actions that the trust could take in implementing these programs. I took that language almost verbatim out of the FAME statute, the Finance Authority of Maine. So the right to make agreements, the uh, right to, the, the, the power, I should say, to um, um, acquire and dispose of property, et cetera. I, 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 I looked there and I, uh, and I worked with Lindsay uh, to point to those places so that um, you should have some assurance that this language has been vetted on prior occasions. So notwithstanding the fact that we're uh, at the 11th hour here, I hope you would take some comfort in knowing that uh, these came from, these are, these are well-defined terms. Uh, and I'll stop there and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Stoddard. Are there now questions for Mr. Stoddard from members of the committee? I don't see any questions. Um, I was just taking a look at the amended language. I guess I would pose a question, Mr. Stoddard. Are the financial institutions um, comfortable with the language as far as you know? Um, I, I, I do not know. Um, it's 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 pure speculation on my part about um, you know we don't we don't have we're we're not in the midst of seeking capital from other organizations at this time and so I haven't reached that point of a conversation we, and part of the reason for that is twofold one is we were very fortunate to receive a large federal grant about ten years ago. And that has provided the source of capital that has been sufficient to cover the demand for loans in that period of time. So we haven't had to go out and ask for new capital. Ad additionally, as you, as you will be aware, last year when your committee and the rest of the legislature enacted LD 1733, that was the main jobs and recovery plan, which was the, your plan for how to spend the federal funds from the ARPA. Uh, legislation, $50 million of that was directed to be administered by the Efficiency Main Trust over the next four years. And that is more capital, some of which we could theoretically use to capitalize some of this financing. In particular, we're thinking we would like to do that with municipalities and schools so that they can get some projects done with no money down. Um, but they would need some kind of um, uh, arrangement like a lease, uh, a, a, a municipal, what's called a municipal lease. And that's another example of a term that I wanted to add to the definitions in this statute so that we could uh, be clear that we have that authority. But we, my point being, we may already have the capital we need for the foreseeable future. So I, I'm not asking people out in the investor community uh, right now for more funding. Um, but so I, I don't have a I don't have any feedback from them. Um, I do want to say, however, a Senator, that uh, just to uh, 
assuage some potential concerns. We're not asking for more money. We're not, we're not proposing, this bill doesn't propose to move money around or uh, establish new allowable uses for any uh, of the funding streams that we already have. Thank you for that clarification. Are there other questions, information needs that this committee has in regards to the proposed legislation? Madam Chair, if I could. Yes, Senator Lawrence. So I believe I'm just looking at the list of people who want to testify on this bill. And there ah, is okay. another person who wants to testify in favor. Um, so you may want to go to that. Um, I believe it's somebody from the Union of Concerned Scientists, um, Steve Clemmer, wishing to testify in favor. Thank you, Senator. I did not have access to that list, so I appreciate that. Jason, if you can bring the individual over, we can hear his testimony. Should be on his way. Okay. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you and see you. So please introduce yourself and, and provide us with your remarks. Excellent. Thank you. Well, good morning, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and other distinguished members of the committee. Um, my name is Steve Clemmer. I'm the Director of Energy Research in the Union of Concerned Scientists Clean Energy Program. I am a resident of Maine. Um, UCS is the nation's leading science-based nonprofit organization with more than a half of a million supporters, including more than 2,500 in Maine. I offer this testimony in support of LD337. I, I want to apologize. I only found out about this bill uh, late yesterday, so I really haven't had time to prepare any written testimony yet. In addition to uh, testifying in support of LD 1659 last year, I led the development of a recommendation to create a st state green bank as a member of the energy working group for the Maine Climate Council um, that was included in the Maine Climate Action Plan. And that recommendation was based off of a report I co-authored back in 2016 that was entitled Green Banks Transforming Clean Energy Financing in Maine. So I've been thinking about these issues for for quite a while. Um, the high energy prices Mainers are currently paying for energy um, this winter that have been further exacerbated by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the decisions by the US and many other countries to ban Russian oil and natural gas imports really underscores the importance of rapidly scaling up clean energy programs like this. This is especially important for low and moderate income households in Maine who are really struggling to make ends meet and have fewer resources to invest in more efficient houses, heat pumps, electric vehicles, solar, and other clean energy technologies that have high upfront costs, but at the same time deliver significant and immediate energy bill savings and emission reductions. We support the modest changes and clarifications in LD337, which will help Efficiency Maine increase the effectiveness and the benefits of implementing new loan products and services. They should also give the financial community more confidence in partnering with Efficiency Maine to deliver these products and services and expand their reach. And we really appreciate the due diligence that Efficiency Maine has gone through over the past year to conduct a gap analysis, as well as to gather input from key stakeholders and outside experts. In particular, um, we support the language added under Section 6 that would expand and diversify the potential funding sources needed to capitalize the uh, Clean Energy Accelerator. Michael had just mentioned the, the money that has come through um, through the ARPA funds. Um, in addition to that, um, UCS has been working very closely with the Coalition for Green Capital and other groups at the national level to advance the proposed national accelerator that's included in the, the Build Back Better Act. And you know, while that bill has been stalled in the Senate for the last few months, I think there's some promising signs from Senator Manchin and others that um, the climate and clean energy provisions of that bill could move forward in some fashion, especially with the, the crisis that's going on right now in Ukraine and uh, needing to 
uh, reduce uh, dependency on fossil fuels and help lower the prices. So allowing Efficiency Maine to tap into other public and private sources of funding to help capitalize the accelerator is important for two reasons. One, in the event that the, the national accelerator doesn't move forward, um, but also if it does move forward, um, it can obviously help greatly expand the reach of, of these programs. But being able to diversify those funding sources to tap into other state and other types of funding sources is also important to, to make sure that things move forward efficiently. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Clemmer, for your testimony. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, we appreciate you being here today. And just as a reminder, this committee does like written testimony. So if you have an opportunity to submit what you just presented in writing, that would be helpful. But sure, I can do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I better check with Jason to find out if there's anyone else in the uh, attendee list who's here to speak in favor of this bill, Jason. Uh, nope, this, that's everyone on my list. Okay, anyone speaking against? I don't have anyone on my list other than the, uh, Michael Stoddard and, and Steve Connor. Okay, and so neither for nor against, nobody there either? No. Okay. So unless there's somebody there who at the last minute wants to speak and can raise their hand. I see a note from Rob Wood. Representative Foster, do you have a question? You're muted, sir. You're still muted. <laughs> Trying to read your lips. Sorry, uh, I was just gonna point out that Rob Wood had his hand up for testifying. Thank you. So Jason, uh, if you could bring Rob Wood in, please we'll hear what he has to say. <clears throat> You'll be right over. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Senator Thank Patel. You joining us. Please go right ahead. Good morning, Senator Patel. Thank you, um, and Senator Lawrence and members of the committee. Um, uh, I, I understand that you have a, um, a long day ahead of you, so I'll just offer very brief comments um, in support of, uh, of this legislation. Um, and, and like Mr. Clemmer, uh, have not had a chance to um, write down testimony yet. I will aim to do that later today. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, primarily um, just offer kind of a appreciation for um, Mr. Stoddard and Efficiency Maine for um, doing all of the, the um, you know, very detailed and, and um, uh, excellent due diligence that they've done um, to, to move forward. Uh, the Clean Energy Accelerator, as well as the CPACE program. And, um, you know, specifically just wanted to note that um, uh, uh, the, the CPACE legislation that um, this committee um, uh, passed uh, last session, um, that would, you know, be uh, its efficiency main is, um, is moving forward uh, with, with rulemaking for the, to implement the CPACE program um, and incorporating that into the um, uh, accelerator program that they're developing. And um, we feel that many of the provisions in, in this, uh, this bill before you today um, will be important for ensuring um, smooth and effective implementation of, of the CPACE program in addition to the accelerator. And we we'll just echo many of the remarks that um, Mr. Clemmer made as well regarding the importance of, of clean energy financing mechanisms, um, especially at this, this time. Um, and I will leave my remarks there and uh, just say thank you for the opportunity and um, we'll hope to submit written comments later today. Um, but we're very supportive of, of the bill and efficiency means efforts and appreciate their, um, their, their work on this bill. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Wood, for being here. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, we'll beam you back over. Senator Stewart, did you have a question or you just... Okay. Anyone else that wishes to speak 
on this bill? Okay, seeing none, um, I believe we will close the public hearing on LD337. Madam Chair? Yes. If there's a quorum present, um, I think um, unless there's any objection from the committee, I'd like to move that we go into work session and just work this bill and get it done. I was wondering that myself and it looks as though we do have a quorum present. So I would um, accept a motion to go into work session. On so this moved. Topic. Moved by Senator Lawrence, Representative Sachs, are you seconding? Yes, ma'am. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we go into work session on LD337. Um, Lindsay, do you wanna review what we've just heard? And see if there's any questions that need to be clarified. Um, I apologize, what would you like me to review? <laughs> well, I'm assuming people have had a chance to look at the language, but it might be good to just quickly put it up there if you can do that. Okay, I have not done bill analysis on this. Um, so I can, I can certainly share the amendment and try to walk through it as best I can. It's gonna be a little on the fly, so I'll apologize in advance. It's pretty brief. <laughs> Bear with me one moment. Okay, so I am sharing my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so this is um, Senator Lawrence's amendment to LD337. So this is an act regarding the powers of Efficiency Main Trust and the Clean, Main Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator. Um, so as Mr. Stoddard spoke about, um, you know, one of the first things is to um, modify the existing powers, duties, and limitations for Efficiency Main Trust with respect to the trust itself. Um, so I'm gonna scroll down to the additions. So the new language um, explicitly states that Efficiency Main Trust has the ability to make agreements, obtain necessary certifications to carry out its powers and duties, um, obtain insurance, um, seek professional services, including legal services, um, and to acquire, use, improve, and dispose of property. So that applies to all of their operations. Um, then we get down into the specific changes to the accelerator program. Um, so the amendment includes some definitions, includes the definition of a lease and a security interest uh, and um, discusses the establishment of the program um, and sort of just kicks over to subsection seven where it gets into a little more specifics about the funding. Uh, and we'll get there in a moment. Um, so in terms of finance and investment, um, there's just clarifying language that the accelerator may provide finance and investment services, including but not limited to overseeing prudent, non-controlling equity investments in businesses engaged in building, developing, financing, owning, operating, or supplying materials for qualified projects, lending mother, lending money or otherwise extending credit, um, and clarifying, and this is why we define leases, that the accelerator may provide capital to qualified projects in the form of leases, um, and then there's a catch-all that was already an existing law. Um, we get down to section, this is subsection seven. And so it's expanding the ways in which the accelerator may be capitalized. Um, so instead of just federal funds, um, now it's state funds appropriated or allocated for purposes consistent with the section. Revenues of the trust received from transmission and distribution utilities, natural gas utilities, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative Trust Fund, um, and ISO New England. Um, also funds from settlements that may be approved by the PUC or the Office of the Attorney General or other governmental entities, um, and then other public or private sources. So expanding the ability for the um, program to receive those funds. And that is it. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Lindsay. That was excellently done. Just there were a few members who were not here during the presentation, so it was probably helpful to just review what's in front of us. Uh, are there questions at this point, or I would be willing to make, uh, entertain a motion, Representative Stewart? Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question, and I think uh, Mr. Stoddard, I, I, I thought about it after he left the public hearing, and then was going to ask him during the work session. 
And look at that. We're already there. So <laughs> um, if we could get him back real quick, I just have one question for him. Okay. We'll bring Mr. Starter back. Senator Lawrence, do you have a question or a comment while we're waiting? No, I, I was going to make a motion, but okay. I'm happy deferring to um, Senator Stewart. Okay. We'll get back to you on the motion. Senator Stewart, we have Michael Stoddard back with us if you want to pose Great. your question. Thank you very much. And uh, good to see you, Mr. Stoddard. Um, so uh, the, the, the question is, is there any intent to use ratepayer funds to capitalize these, um, the, the funding for this project, anything beyond what would currently be the case as of today? It seems like it's mostly geared towards allocation of ARPA funds and things like that, but I just wanted to confirm that. That is correct. Uh, there's no, we have no ask and we have no intention right now. Um, what, what we, <clears throat> one thing that you see in some states is something called on bill financing, which is a tool um, where you use the utilities billing system and uh, it, it, I could see a future in which we might, um, <clears throat> If there was a policy that was enacted that said we do want you to um, use ratepayer funds, which you do now with our our regular energy efficiency programs, we give the money out as rebates, so it's cash. But there could be situations where you said, well, actually, we want you to give a little bit of cash, but we also want the customer to pay back the balance of the project cost. But we know they can't come up with that initially, especially if there may be lower moderate income. Um, or small businesses, and so we would be, we would, we would want you, Efficiency Maine, to loan them the balance of the project cost. And so it could be a situation in the future where it might be uh, funds that we got from the utilities from ratepayers. There's no program like that today, and we're not planning one today. But we thought that it would, uh, people would want to be able to look back to the statute and see that we had the authority to do that if uh, that were approved. That's the only question I had, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I see Representative Foster has a question. Is this for Mr. Stoddard? Yeah, yes, thank you. I didn't have one, but he's raised that question in my mind. So uh, thank you, Mr. Stoddard. Uh, I'm wondering, from what you just said, first you said something about a policy change, but then it sounded like this would, in fact, allow uh, you to uh, to use rate payer funds at, at, as the language is now, or, or would it require, would it give you that opportunity, but require future policy change to do so? Thank you. Thank you uh, for the question, Representative. Um, the, I believe that it would give us the ability to use rate payer funds for loans, but it wouldn't give us the ability to ask for more ratepayer funds than we're already getting. So we're, we're already getting a budget every year from ratepayer funds that, and that's driven by, um, you know, the, the determination of how much is the meets the standard of the, the, that we're directed to harvest of energy efficiency. And it has to be uh, approved by the commission. That dollar amount is not going to change. Uh, this is really just giving us more ways in which we could spend that dollar amount. So we're not em envisioning suddenly to go back and tap that like a piggy bank uh, to just expand the funding that we have. It's to take the existing budgets we have and have more options for how we would invest it for the best interest of the rate pairs. You all set, Representative Foster? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Other questions for Mr. Stoddard? Seeing none, thank you for, oops, wait a second. Uh, Representative Kessler, did you have a question for Mr. Stoddard before we- Thank you, yes. Um, as, the, as the language of this amendment is, is written and you know with the existing statute of the Clean Energy Accelerator, is there anything preventing e Efficiency Maine from engaging in helping to finance like larger grid scale projects, like grid scale renewables? Uh, I'm sorry to say I don't have the original Green Bank legislation right in front of me, but I do think there were some limits there, Representative Kessler. I think, um, I think that uh, 
transmission distribution infrastructure was not listed among the uh, eligible uses of the Green Bank. Although, as you point out, um, renewable energy projects are one of the things that was listed in this in the legislation as an eligible use. Um, I will tell you that. So, I guess I would say theoretically, yes, we could. Um, our gap analysis that we've done recently um, has led us to the to to believe that the grid scale, uh, utility scale, renewable energy projects are not having any trouble finding financing right now. So we weren't thinking that that would be a top priority for us initially as we, as we sort of take baby steps to launch the programs of this. Um, we were going to focus more on smaller customers initially. Does that answer your question, Representative Kessler? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Representative Sachs? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to clarify for Representative Kessler is a proud co-sponsor and lots of work on 1659. You can go back to the text of that bill. There is a list of qualified projects if you're interested. And I appreciate, Mr. Stoddard, this. Um, the tweet, what I really see is just tweaks to clarify understanding. And, and we knew that probably would happen with such a big bill as the accelerator bill was. Um, stewarded by our capable colleague, uh, Representative Ziegler, um, but that these technical changes would have been necessary no matter when this came. So I'm glad that it's coming forward today in this bill. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so seeing no further questions from committee members for Representative uh, Michael Stoddard, I will now turn to Senator Lawrence, who I believe has a motion. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I move uh, to pass as amended. Second it. Is there a second to that motion? Second Representative Ziegler, I heard you say that. Thank you for voicing that. It's been moved and seconded uh, to pass. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, I will then ask Jason to go to the roll call on the motion ought to pass. Senator Lawrence. Yes. Senator Lawrence is a yes. Senator Vitelli. Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart. Yes. Senator Stewart is a yes. Representative Barry. Not present. Representative Cuddy. Not present. Representative Grahowski. Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler? Yes. Representative Kessler is a yes. Representative Ziegler? Yes. Representative Ziegler is a yes. Representative Sachs? Yes. Representative Sachs is a yes. Representative Wadsworth? Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Representative Grignon? Not present. Representative Foster? Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. Representative Carlo? Yes. Representative Carlo is a yes. Is 10 in favor of the motion and three absent. Did Senator Vitelli have to leave? I think she's I'm sorry, muted. I was muted, but I was closing the work session on LD337 and turning things back over to you, Senator. Thank you very much. So it sounds like the motion prevailed. Is that right, Jason? I have uh, 10 in favor of the motion and three absent. That's correct. Great. Okay. So we'll go back into, and thank you to Senator Vitelli for chairing and, and fitting in a, in a pinch to get that done and get another bill off our plate. Um, we're going back to our uh, public hearings. We have one, two, three, four, five, six public hearings to complete today. So I'll go first uh, to doing them in order as Representative Barry requested. Uh, so we'll go back to the order and we'll go to LD uh, 318, an act to provide uh, more options to Maine electric service customers and support Maine's climate goals. And I'll recognize the sponsor of the bill, our own uh, Representative Grahowski. 
Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, good morning again to all of my honorable colleagues on this committee. I appreciate uh, Director Stoddard um, sort of teeing up a little bit of the concepts uh, in this bill, including the importance of the on-bill financing option. So I think it's a good, uh, good order we've ended up here. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to testify this morning in support of LD 318, which I'll just say the new name once because it's long. Uh, it's renamed to Resolve to direct the Office of Public Advocate to study reforming Maine's system of retail electricity supply to provide more options to Maine customers and support Maine's climate goals. Uh, as we experience so acutely in this committee, we have spent a good deal of time discussing Maine's electricity usage, supply, billing and delivery, and the climate impacts of our actions. We have wrestled with topics like how to support Maine's climate goals, increase renewable energy development at different scales, deal with performance issues and widespread customer dissatisfaction with our investor-owned utilities, and smartly finance the necessary investments in generation and transmission to decarbonize our economy. Ratepayer costs are something we discuss daily, and now the conversation as I think you would agree, is as pressing as ever with 80, the over 80% increases in standard offer rates for customers in our IOU territories this year. Maine has adopted goals to reduce its climate emissions and increase beneficial electrification, especially of Maine's home heating and transportation sectors. The price of electricity supply can delay or frustrate the achievements of such goals, which is just one of many good reasons to try to contain costs. In addition, customer satisfaction with our two IOUs remains embarrassingly low compared to elsewhere in the country, so low that our Public Utilities Commission has recently opened an investigation into the corporate ownership of Central Maine Power to try to identify some of these root causes. Our frustration with utility billing, service, and cost is serious and now seemingly status quo. Mainers have lots of choices in virtually every aspect of their lives as consumers, but not so much in their role as ratepayers. The limited choices they're afforded via our current electricity system leads to frustration, anger, or sometimes even despair. No one piece of legislation can address all of these issues uh, that we experience in transitioning to a decarbonized customer-centered future. However, it is time for consumers to have a consumer-driven study of options for this future. That is why the study proposed in this resolve would be conducted by our public advocate. And that is what my amendment to LD318 uh, provides. The current system of standard offer service and competitive electricity provider service has not delivered to Maine customers the full benefit of retail competition envisioned when the state separated T&D assets from generation. Instead, we've seen some consumers be victimized by certain competitive electricity providers, while others are confused about standard offer service and how to try to be proactive and reduce their electricity bills. Uh, more than a dozen other states have full and open competition, which can provide innovative supply options and products to consumers to increase consumer satisfaction, assist customers in selecting the supply choices they desire, assist customers in financing renewable energy and beneficial electrification options, encourage customers to save money through time of use pricing options to encourage load shifting and help promote climate goals. Perhaps there are other ways to achieve these benefits for consumers. Maybe there is a way to reform our current standard offer system to insulate ratepayers from price shocks. The point of this study is to determine if how we've dealt with competitive supply over the past 20 plus years has been in the best interest of our constituents or if we could do better. I hope that this study will point us in the direction of increased access to renewables for interested consumers and time of use pricing to enable people to adapt their energy budgets and usage to their needs and ability to pay. I also encourage the OPM stakeholders involved in this study should we uh, move forward with it to join together to push for widespread adoption of on-bill financing to promote beneficial electrification for residential and commercial customers. The study as proposed includes a comprehensive review of consumer protections and education efforts. It also requests consideration of a state hosted website where all providers are required to post their supply offers, offers and where consumers can easily compare prices and shop for the type of supply that is attractive to them. 
I think this could be a very helpful resource for us to share with constituents who, at least mine are, asking for information about their options. If we do not make the effort to consider reforming Maine's electricity supply system at a time when all Mainers are suffering from high electricity prices, we may never do so in the future. Thus, I think LD318 is a timely piece of legislation worthy of thoughtful consideration in our remaining days together. Thank you so much for listening to my testimony regarding 318. I would be happy to answer any questions that I can at this time. Thank you very much, Representative Grahowski. Um, are there questions from the committee? Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Grahowski, for the testimony. Just curious, you spent some time talking about uh, ratepayer uh, dissatisfaction with the utilities, but I want to clarify this particular resolve now uh, deals only with the elect electricity providers and not transmission and delivery utilities. Is that, am I right there? Or I just wanna make sure we're, that's the only piece we're talking about as far as how uh, rates would be affected. Uh, thank you for the question, Representative Foster. So in some states, instead of the utilities being in charge of the billing, which is something that we hear serious complaints about uh, from CMP and now I'm hearing them from uh, my versant constituents as well, um, there are companies that actually provide that service so that you would not be getting a bill directly from CMP or Versant, but rather from the retailer that you had selected uh, to work with. And what, I, what I've heard anecdotally is that, um, you know, these bills are a lot more user-friendly. They give people options, um, you know, can give people options to say, you know, I love uh, I love hydro. I want 100% hydro, or I love wind, and I want that too. And it's it's being billed to them in a um, a more user friendly way. And I think that's and people could disagree what you know is user friendly or not. But the point is, in some states, it's not the utilities sending out the bills anymore. And um, so that is that is the connection there to our current T and D status quo operations. Great, any follow-up Representative Foster? No, thank you. Okay, other questions for Representative Grahowski? Seeing none, thank you very much, Representative. And we'll now go on to, uh, I don't see any co-sponsors testifying, so we'll go on to um, people testifying in favor of this legislation. And I just wanna thank you, Jason, for setting up the list um, so that it's organized um, in a way we have talked about at the last meeting. So I'll go first to Travis uh, Kavula um, from NRG and Energy Inc. She's gonna be testifying in favor. And if you can also, Jason, bring across uh, Tony Buxton, who will be testifying in favor. Uh, thank you very much, Senator, and you got the name correct. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm Travis Cavula, uh, and uh, it's great to be joining you, Senator Lawrence, uh, Representative Barry, members of the committee. Um, I'm Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for NRG. Uh, previously, I was almost a decade uh, in public service as a Montana Public Service Commissioner, uh, actually regulating uh, certain utilities that are affiliated with operating companies that do business in Maine. So I understand and sympathize with some of the concerns that you've faced over the years. And uh, I also held during my time as regulator, uh, the position as president of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. Uh, in my national roles, I've, I've been engaged in the conversation about the appropriate structure of New England power markets for almost a decade. And I always come back to one principle that customers tend to want a cleaner supply of electricity. And when they're given a visible and affordable choice to do so, their own behavior can be a catalyst for an energy transition that shouldn't just be coming from the top down. Um, my current employer, NRG, is a Fortune 500 producer and retailer of energy, and our customers' desire for cleaner and more affordable energy supplies led us to sign 2,600 megawatts of power purchase agreements for renewables in just the last few years. 
Uh, just to give a comparison, that's that's enough renewable power to serve uh, about half of Maine's total electricity needs uh, for a year, though that portfolio is spread uh, across the country. Um, in Maine in particular, one of our companies, Zoom, offers a plan right now to central Maine power customers that's cost competitive with standard offer service, but also provides customers 50% of their energy from renewable sources. Uh, we also offer a product that is lower priced than standard offer service uh, and allows customers to fix that rate for two years, uh, insulating themselves from the price shocks that could come from next year's SOS rate. Um, as the committee knows uh, as, and has already heard the statistics on a couple of times in this in the course of this morning, uh, the SOS rates have risen substantially uh, and gas prices worldwide continue to rise, uh, placing upward pressure on customers. If customers had been encouraged to lock in rates under a 12 or 24 month contract with competitive suppliers in the fall of 2021, uh, they could have saved a substantial amount of money off of the 2022 standard offer services. We had products in the market that would have saved them 15 to 20% on energy supply if they'd signed a contract in October or November. Uh, and so I think the bottom line is that we are concerned that the current regulatory structure doesn't do enough to empower customers to choose alternative energy providers, which in turn creates a system where competitive supply of electricity is stagnating. Now, that's not true for all customers in Maine. In fact, uh, nearly every single megawatt hour that serves the industrial market in Maine is uh, activated through the competitive retail market. It's virtually ubiquitous there. Similarly, for medium commercial and industrial customers, 60 to 70 percent of the energy used by those customers is supplied by the competitive retail market. And those numbers have held steady for the better part of a decade. But for residential customers and small business customers, shopping for energy supply has declined since the program's beginning. Uh, in 2014, about 30% of those customers' energy needs were served by the competitive market. Today, it's about 10%. Uh, so at a time when customers more than ever are proactively making choices for things like streaming services and data plans, the same thing can't be said about Maine's residential electricity market. And this study would endeavor to find out how things like that can change. Uh, specifically, NRG appreciates that the study will ask a number of questions. Uh, among those that we're most interested are, uh, number one, are there ways to make sure customers have more information and better visibility around their options through things like a better shopping website? Uh, the lack of these ready-to-use tools actually encourages marketers of these products to engage uh, in marketing tactics that I personally as a consumer would not appreciate um, and shouldn't be relied on typically in the market. So we've got to think of ways to make marketing better, more user-friendly, easier to leverage for consumers who might want to buy a type of product like this. Second, are there ways uh, to make sure utility investments and smart meters are being leveraged to provide customers more access to data about their energy usage? Uh, it, it's, it's an important question to ask. Why is the smart grid that millions of dollars have been spent on, why is the smart grid so dumb effectively? Uh, because it's not being leveraged to transform the customer experience candidly. Third, uh, I think it's time that we consider that customers should have a bill of rights uh, whether they're taking service from competitive suppliers or from standard offer service. Uh, fourth, and this is one that the bill sponsor, um, whose efforts we appreciate, uh, has teed up, is there a way for standard offer service and competitive suppliers uh, to own the billing function to customers uh, rather than the utility and to create performance requirements and incentives around that billing function to minimize errors? Um, that, that's, I think, a very important reform in light of what Maine has experienced recently. Um, and then finally, is there a way to leverage the competitive retail market uh, to get customers themselves to use their buying power to make greater investments in clean energy? Um, NRG hopes to reach a system of regulation uh, where that kind of innovation is promoted and rewarded under state policy. And we have in mind particular innovations like on-bill financing and smart home systems, renewable power, home power power storage, and EV charging infrastructure. Uh, in other markets, we can provide real-time information on a customer's electricity bill to date, allowing them to better plan their usage and give them the opportunity to manage their costs. 
Uh, the sponsor's amendment does not dictate that NRG's vision will become Maine's, but it does create a process that is consumer focused and consumer driven to determine what vision will become a reality for Maine's electricity customers in the future. And, and we're very happy and excited at the prospect of participating in that study alongside other stakeholders through the OPA. So we ask that uh, you pass LD318 as amended, uh, and I'd be glad to take uh, any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from the committee for Mr. Kavula? Representative Foster. Oh, Representative Foster, did you have a question? My unmute button's not working well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cavula, for being here today. Uh, as you know, this committee has dealt with uh, the, the retail uh, opportunities, if you will, uh, in the state of Maine. We've had issues with it, and, and the committee's had work over my four years on it uh, from time to time uh, in, in, in varying areas. Uh, one of the questions I would have on uh, this uh, proposal as as the Office of the Public Advocate would look at this is uh, the thought that we should move to full retail choice. And I'll just voice my concern that uh, many customers who have gone to retail choice in Maine have found that uh, up until recently, the standard offer uh, long-term ended up being uh, financially a better choice for them. And they, they've gone back to that. Uh, and I'm wondering uh, if you could speak to why your company would think that not, uh, not offering the standard offer in conjunction or in addition to uh, retail uh, would, would uh, not be the best way to go. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Representative Foster, I, I think you could do it either way, to be candid, uh, and states have reached different determinations on these outcomes, and what we're asking here today is to take a, take a look at that. What I will say is that the dominant position of the standard offer service, uh, which creates a kind of provider of first resort uh, to 90% of the customers now in the residential market who use it, uh, basically squeezes out a lot of the effective competition you would have for the rest of that market. Um, and it's, it's hard to compete. Uh, it's hard to have a competitive market when you have that kind of structure. And it does end up exposing customers to, who are on standard offer service to certain risks as that standard offer service price resets, um, as, as we've seen just this year. Uh, is a good indication of that. So I, I do think retailers um, have the ability to add, add a lot of value here. And I'll, I'll just give, go back to the example that I had. If you had signed up for um, the product that I was describing in the fall of last year that we offer, it would have indeed been above the standard offer service price for 2021, um, but it would have been lower, significantly lower, than the price for standard offer service in 2022. And in essence, you would have been buying an insurance-like product from us uh, that allows you to fix your rate over a couple of years time and thus avoid the price swing um, that, that you saw when the SOS prices were reset. So I, I think there needs to be some sort of better reflection of that. I, I think one other thing we mean when we talk about full retail competition is again, going back to uh, owning the billing function. Well, one, of, one of the customer service practices that we've heard as a concern in the retail market is that, it, and, and these, and let me be clear, these retailers should be regulated out of business in my view, but we've heard from certain residential customers that all of a sudden they'll find themselves having been enrolled uh, in a product that they did not sign up for. And when you, when you put instead of the billing function in the hands of the supplier where its brand is visible on the bill, it becomes very obvious to a customer when their supplier is changed, as opposed to a supplier's costs that end up hiding out on the third or fourth page of a utility delivered bill. So I, I think there are, you know, we kind of face uh, two paths here. One where you can look at the market and say, wow, it's gone from 30 to 10%. Why don't we just take it away altogether? Uh, which I understand is what certain parties might advocate here. But I don't think the right approach is to stop people from having a choice. I think the right approach is to try to give people more choices and to give more people visibility around these products that exist in the market, to try to 
in essence, pull pull the lever of competition uh, in a regulated structure uh, such that you can use it to address some of the consumer services problems you've had with both retailers and the utility, um, as well as uh, for clean energy policy and other policy considerations. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, any follow-up, Representative Foster? No, thank you. Okay, Representative Wadsworth, do you have a question? I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here, Mr. Kavula. So, I mean, I know you don't work in Maine, but what's any guesstimate of what the cost would be with separate billing um, on, on the Maine ratepayer? Is there any way to estimate that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Wadsworth, I, I don't have an estimate handy for you at the moment. Um, I know for, uh, so Maryland's Public Service Commission has recently ordered the adoption of a voluntary um, supplier consolidated billing approach. Um, and their implementation costs do amount to millions of dollars. Um, but I, I think ultimately some of those software solutions will be scalable if other jurisdictions adopt it. It depends on the billing um, the software infrastructure that uh, utilities use. There's also a question of cost allocation. Um, should, should that be paid by um, consumers themselves or should those costs be allocated uh, to the competitive supply community? Um, and, and so I think we're willing to discuss those in the context of a study. I, I, will, think, I will say that I think the introduction of, uh, as we call it, supplier consolidated billing would enhance the overall vitality uh, of the market and, and provide a public benefit. But of, of course, as your question implies, that needs to be taken in view of the costs that, that do occur. Thank you. Any follow-up, Representative Wadsworth? Okay. Uh, any other questions from the committee for Mr. Kavula? Seeing none, thank you very much for uh, coming in to testify. And we'll now go on to um, Tony Buxton, who wishes to testify in favor of this bill. I, um, he, he's not in the um, attendees, but I think his Steve Hudson may be speaking for him. Okay, can you bring Mr. Hudson over and we can check that out? Hi, hey, Steve. Uh, Tony had signed up to testify in favor of this bill. Are you presenting testimony in his place? Yes. Uh, yes, Senator Lawrence, thank you for uh, recognizing me. I am um, in uh, real-time communication with, Ms. with Tony and who is trying to reconnect. He's been, he was on for the first two hours of the committee's time, uh, had, to, had to drop to address something else. And I'm tap dancing to see if he can come back on. <laughs> if Jason can spot him in the in the uh, 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 attendee space. If not, I will try to briefly summarize what I believe he was going to do. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, Steve, and try to summarize what Tony was going to testify to? Thank you. Well, I, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Lawrence. I think Chairman Barry's there. I it comes. Things are coming and going on my screen at least this uh, uh, today, so I apologize for if I miss anyone. Members of the EUT committee, I'm Stephen Hudson. I'm an attorney with Purdy Flaherty. Um, I am here today to speak on behalf of the Industrial Energy Consumer Group, uh, which is uh, uh, a trade association of Maine's largest uh, consumers uh, who are active in energy policy and uh, have worked with consumers of all sizes to try to reduce costs for all consumers. Um, uh, gen we have found because we are the largest consumers and because we have the, the, the size uh, to have dedicated staff that, that retail competition works for industrial consumers um, and uh, we think it has brought significant benefits. Um, but we also we have observed uh, what we see is uh, across uh, other states in which some of our companies have have uh, manufacturing facilities as well as competitors do, that where you don't have re retail competition, uh, at least for businesses, costs are generally higher than they are where there is competition. So um, 
IECG would be glad as a representative of a large business to participate in the study as proposed by the uh, sponsor's amendment. We think that the sponsor amendment has um, does a good job of trying to balance the range of options, everything from how do we tweak the, the standard offer to better serve Mainers to what other systems are out there, whether it's full regulation or whether it's complete deregulation. Uh, we just think that all those options are on the table and that we really believe that this is the time to study it given um, everyone's focus. I, I know from speaking with many of legislators that your phones constantly ring um, and uh, with folks who are concerned about their electricity costs this year. So we're hopeful that the committee will move ahead with, with the study as proposed and happy to answer any questions. Senator Lawrence, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hudson. Are there questions from the committee for Mr. Hudson? I don't see any. I do have one question, um, Steve. We do have Tony Buxton here right now. Do you want me to bring him over or um, did you do a, enough of a good job to not warrant him uh, coming over? If you could unmute. Yep, I muted myself out of, courtesy, out of respect for the committee. Um, I, I would suggest you bring him in. Like, If he's had a chance to hear what I said, I think he can be very brief, but he may have some additional um, uh, additional advice, uh, recommendations for the committee. Okay, I'm, I'm holding you to him being brief. So just so you know, Steve. <laughs> um, why don't you bring Mr. Buxton over? Okay, he should be right there. Okay, Tony, why don't you go ahead and um, introduce yourself and um, present uh, any additional testimony you want on this bill. It, it took a minute for, for me to get connected. I apologize. Uh, Senator Lawrence, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Lawrence, members of the committee. I'm Tony Buxton from Pretty Flaherty. Uh, uh, I just fell over. Um, Steve uh, uh, presented testimony for IECG. I will be brief. Uh, I have two things to say generally. Uh, first, as you all deal with the close of the session, I'm sure you're asking yourselves uh, what you can do to reduce costs for ratepayers. There are, quite frankly, uh, not a lot of ideas in comparison to the need. Um, and that's uh, something for which all of us can take some responsibility. One of the purposes of this legislation is to create ideas and give you options that can be considered by the commission, the public advocate, and you uh, uh, in the future as to ways to do things a little bit better. The issue is not uh, that you don't like competition. It is that the ideas about competition are relatively few in coming forward in a way that you can use them. And the purpose of this study would be, as we understand it, uh, to try to find some ways to see what the rest of the world is doing uh, and see if there are any good ideas that we could import. Uh, we, we can only see positive things about a study and we hope you'll do that. Secondly, I wanna note Senator, and you may want to cut me off, but I just wanna give you notice there was, to my knowledge, no public testimony on the amendment that you've adopted uh, to uh, uh, Senator Stewart's bill. And uh, we'll be providing you later this afternoon, I hope, with our research on the Internal Revenue Code and what the section that has been of some discussion may mean. Uh, with that, I won't get into the merits. But I want to thank the committee for their time and uh, I want to assure you that the Industrial Energy Consumer Group will continue to be a resource if called upon by you and the GEO and the OPA and the PUC to try to help lower costs and at the same time get rapidly to zero carbon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And are there questions from the committee for Ms. Hodson? I don't see any. Tony, I just want to congratulate you on your casual attire. Thank you. Um, we don't often see you that way, but you look very relaxed. And I'd like to show you my sneakers, but it would just be really awkward. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Bye.
We'll go on, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll go on to people testifying against this legislation. Um, Jason, do you have uh, Jafet Ells from AARP to beam across? Yes, he should be right there. Okay, and if you could also bring beam across William Harwood from the Public Advocate's Office. He's testifying near the foreigner against, and that will allow us to uh, get all people over who are gonna testify. So Jafet, you have the uh, floor and uh, go ahead, introduce yourself, tell us who you're with and, and where you're from and present your testimony. Good morning, <clears throat> great to be here. And uh, kudos to Mr. Buxton for his plaid shirt. I was wearing the same one. So I had to quickly change, God forbid testifiers wear the same <laughs> attire for our hearings. Uh, my name is Jay Fidels, I'm the advocacy director with AARP Maine. As many of you know, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit organization with more than 200,000 members statewide. And I'm here today to testify in opposition to LD 318 as proposed. Um, as was noted earlier, this is moving pretty rapidly, which I think we're all used to toward the end of session. Um, and obviously a significant substitute proposal was issued uh, mid afternoon yesterday, um, just the day before our hearing. So um, thank you for everyone for moving so quickly um, and uh, with the opportunity to comment on this. So <clears throat> to be clear, AARP Maine supports initiatives to make essential electricity service more affordable to Maine consumers. We've actually initiated the proceeding that is presently before the Maine Public Utilities Commission that would expand the low income assistance program to more Maine low income households. And we have supported legislation and proceedings to use federal LIHEAP funds to respond to the rather dramatic increase, I think we can all agree, in the standard offer that is causing significant pain to many of our members. We are indeed hearing a lot about utilities, not just the cost, but also the complexity. So while AARP supports any efforts to focus on the reforms to the commission's decision to purchase 100% of the standard offer requirements at one time, which has resulted in the dramatic swings in prices that we're seeing um, and reflect the wholesale market's volatility, we would urge this committee to reject the suggestion <clears throat> as in this bill that the retail electric providers can contribute meaningfully to this particular crisis uh, rather, we would recommend that this, this committee support the public advocate's stated intent to fully examine the policies that are governing our standard offer service. We also would suggest that the PUC initiate a public proceeding to examine why it chose to change its historical policy of purchasing laddered wholesale market contracts for a portion of the load annually, and instead move to purchasing 100% of the load at one point in time. We do not agree with the current purchasing policy for exactly the reasons made clear this winter that we're seeing play out this season. Um, default service or standard offer service should be a plain vanilla electric service that provides the price to beat for retail providers. Um, however, there is no need for additional legislation on this matter at this time, we see. The current law clearly contemplates a more stable procurement policy that the commission should not have ignored. Our major concern with this bill and the proposed substitute is the suggestion that retail electricity providers might provide some benefits to residential consumers and that expanded education or promotion of the retail market is worth evaluating. After more than 20 years of experience with retail energy markets in every restructuring state, um, we would assure the committee that there is no study that documents that residential customers have benefited from being served by retail energy providers as compared to the default service purchased in the wholesale market based on stable and fixed price portfolio of contracts. In every study that reviews actual customer bills for default service compared to retail supplier bills over a reasonable period of time, residential co customers have experienced higher bills and loss of essential electric service. Uh, and I have attached uh, a collection of these publicly available um, studies to my testimony. Furthermore, there's ample evidence from enforcement proceedings here in Maine that other, uh, and other states that document uh, what we would consider abusive sales practices used by retail providers to obtain new customers. Among the suppliers who have been investigated for violations in states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, uh, and who have agreed to fines and changes to their sales and marketing practices are NRG Energy, Spark Energy, 
Parent of Electricity Maine, Palmco Energy, Verde Energy, and Direct Energy. Many of these providers have been subject to numerous enforcement proceedings in multiple states. The harm to lower income customers served by retail providers is particularly shameful due not only to their higher electric bills, but the additional costs that these higher bills impose on ratepayers, who are then subsidizing the low income discount and bill payment arrears programs. If, uh, so in I the face of just, some of this evidence. If I could just interrupt for a second, we do have a three minute rule on testimony. Got you, thank you for that reminder. Uh, I'll just say that I would urge uh, committee members to take a look at the uh, testimony provided. There are um, numerous examples of states where um, ratepayers are paying far more um, with the addition of the retail element. Um, and that our, really our focus is if we're looking to reform the standard offer, there are some existing avenues that we can do that will help save ratepayers money. Uh, and get us through this rather challenging time in terms of utility rates this season. And I'll leave it there for questions. And I would just remind folks that if there are more specific questions to a lot of these things, we will bring in, um, I'm happy to bring in our expert analyst um, on utilities issues, Barbara Alexander. Great. Thank you very much. Are there any questions at this time for JFET? I do not see any. So uh, we'll now go on to testimony neither for nor against. And I believe Bill Harwood is here. So go ahead, Bill. Thank you, Senator Lawrence, Representative Berry, members of the committee. My, my name is William Harwood and I am the public advocate today testifying neither for nor against LD 318. Uh, I won't read my testimony because the uh, bill has evolved since that testimony was drafted. I want to uh, acknowledge <clears throat> uh, Representative Grahowski's efforts to uh, address the concerns. My initial concern with the bill was that it was focusing on reforming the CEP, the <clears throat> competitive electricity provider. And as I said to her, and as you've heard me before, the concern of this office is the standard offer service and the January 1st increase of 80%. Uh, we can't let that happen again. She has graciously agreed that the study will look at both standard offer and CEP service. And for that, I appreciate it. Um, I have <clears throat> sent to the committee clerk one addition to section one to make it very clear that the study should examine options to Maine's current standard offer system. And I hope that the committee will consider that as a friendly amendment to the uh, latest draft proposal. Uh, we continue to be concerned about costs uh, and the standard offer and believe that we can do better than what we have had in the past. Now, as far as the resources available to conduct this study, um, as the committee's aware, there is already a proposal from Senator Vitale, LD 1913. We will be struggling to keep up with this workload uh, we appreciate the uh, reference in the uh, bill to allowing us $200,000 in funds to hire experts. We think that's worthwhile and would be very helpful to us struggling uh, with our workload. But the bottom line is we, we can go forward with the study. The OPA will do its best uh, if this is what the committee wants to come up with a study but I wanna make it clear, we do not share all of NRG's views about retail competition. We will be focusing heavily on the current standard offer system and how we can make sure that what happened on January 1st with 80% increases uh, doesn't happen again. Thank you, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Harwood. Uh, are there questions from the committee for the public advocate? I don't see any, so uh, I'll declare this public hearing closed at this point. Um, since there was conflicting testimony about this, I don't think this is a bill we can work right now. And I understand that Lindsay has some additional language she wants to present. So in the interest of time, we'll move ahead with our public hearing. I have to depart for a few minutes, uh, but uh, Senator Vitelli will be taking over and ably chairing 
um, for the next bills. Um, Senator Vitelli, we're going to um, <coughs> Representative Berry's uh, 1026, then Representative Berry's 1511, and then I believe he's presenting all the other three bills um, that are um, uh, committee bills. So I'll hand off the virtual baton to you. Thank you, Senator Lawrence. I just hope that you will be back uh, in a timely fashion because I will also need to be taking a break around 12, 12, 15. But we'll get as far as we can in the interim. Um, we'll take up first LD 1026. And I will ask the sponsor, Representative Barry, to present his bill. Thank you, Senator Vitelli uh, and fellow members of the committee. It's my pleasure to be here with you today to present the sponsor's amendment <clears throat> to LD 1026, which, as you know, was sent out uh, yesterday around one o'clock for um, our IP list and all members of the public to give people proper notice in order to testify on some um, important and substantive questions. Um, I apologize also that I was not able to be present uh, earlier today for a couple of other important discussions. Um, had a uh, export paperwork issue come up at work, but uh, here we are. Uh, LD 1026 is entitled an act to update the regulation of public utility monopolies. Um, that is simply the activity of the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, their job <clears throat> is to oversee um, all of our policies uh, uh, pertaining to our public utilities, uh, which are by definition natural monopolies. So um, really all of their work pertains to that very important um, discipline that they seek to impose in order to um, replace the, or at least um, provide some semblance of the discipline that the competitive market uh, would otherwise provide. Uh, the bill essentially has three parts and I'll walk you through each part briefly at this time. Uh, I hope you're looking at it. Uh, LD 1026 again is, um, it was sent out yesterday around 1.30 uh, to our IP list and to members. Um, it's also, if you know where to find the committee documents in our OPLA uh, website posted there. Um, and with that, the, the first chunk of LD 1026 is really housekeeping. Um, essentially it, uh, seeks to clean up some definitional concerns that um, I've had for some time since I first realized that we have several different uh, definitions in law, um, in particular, um, competitive electricity provider is, is uh, you know, the, the term that we usually use. We just used it a lot in the last bill. Um, Unfortunately, there is also kind of a competing definition um, and that is competitive service provider. Uh, and then in addition, just to make matters a little less clear, <laughs> we also have used in parts of statute, uh, utility service providers. I think that's just occurs in one place, uh, 35A section 1315. Um, and you know, the, the net effect of, of this, you know, different language to um, describe the same exact thing is that uh, for many readers of the statute, especially those who are newer to it, um, it can be confusing. And all that these providers do is, is to act as competitive electricity providers. They um, are, generally speaking, just doing that. And uh, my uh, bill, the bill before you today, would uh, clean that up. So we're just using one uh, phrase for that purpose. Uh, the next sections of the bill, and they begin on uh, uh, page, let's see, page one at, towards the bottom, section three, are a more substantive change. And in, in, in this piece of the bill, the change to uh, the Public Utilities Commission uh, regulatory uh, parameters would be to allow those, uh, those captive customers of a given utility 
the ability to choose a neighboring utility if they felt that it was in their best interest to do that. Um, this is an issue that has come before this committee before, but never in this form. The bill before you uh, would allow consumer ownership uh, to uh, expand a bit, perhaps into a neighboring uh, territory. Um, we, uh, I think all are familiar with the example of Kennebunk Light and Power where there was an effort to serve all of Kennebunk and uh, that it was strongly supported by many, many people in Kennebunk. Unfortunately, I mean, this was, this was several years ago and the, the person who has, uh, who really championed that issue, Sharon Staz, may she rest in peace, is no longer with us and um, able to speak to this. But I'm sure that if Sharon were with us, she would speak passionately. She was the, the manager of Kennebunk Light and Power during those years when uh, by overwhelming margins, overwhelming margins, the, the people, I'm not sure there was any opposition, the people of Kennebunk who were captive customers of CMP um, asked, uh, beseeched, begged the legislature, uh, the Public Utilities Commission, to allow them to choose uh, to become part of a utility district, which in, in, in voting, uh, they, they, they uh, had, to, had to help elect the board of. And the, 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 the long story short, uh, statute didn't allow it. It, it. it required that the Public Utilities Commission um, uh, see first that there was a willing buyer and a willing seller. There was no ability uh, to move forward unless CMP wanted to, to sell those assets in that other part of the town. And uh, the people of Kennebunk Lighting Power were, were of, of the town of Kennebunk were very, very interested um, and perfectly willing to provide a just compensation, which of course is what is required um, in any issue of eminent domain um, to the utility, but the utility, the incumbent utility was simply unwilling to sell. So this bill would allow for a municipal uh, power district or cooperative uh, to expand in that way if the people who would be served um, have chosen to do it and would provide, as you see in section five, just compensation as required under uh, the constitutional requirements of eminent domain um, to the utility whose property would need to be transferred uh, in ownership in order for that to happen. I wanna remind the committee that um, we call them public utilities for a reason. It is a privilege to hold the monopoly franchise. There is no fundamental law of human nature or of ethics that says that we must allow a utility to hold as captive customers the people of a given part of this state. On the contrary, the Constitution allows us to make a change. And we learned that in the public hearing on LD 1708, where um, in uh, looking back at the study commissioned by the Public Utilities Commission uh, on, that, on, on that question um, from a previous bill, we learned that it was constitutional and um, that provided that just compensation is provided to the utility, um, the ownership can change. So a favorable vote um, should really determine that. It should be enough. There should be some reasonable um, checks and balances regarding process. But other than that, um, this is really a, a matter that the people should decide. It's a question of sovereignty and self-determination and uh, that is the reason for sections three through eight of the bill. Uh, the next portion of the bill, sections nine and forward, are relating to uh, a bill that was voted on earlier today. And um, I had hoped uh, fervently that we would actually hold a public hearing on these measures. Uh, it was never conveyed to me uh, and uh, never conveyed to many members of the committee that there would be a vote without a public hearing. And on the contrary, um, I engaged in some discussions that led me to believe that it was always the intent of everyone involved 
um, to hold a public hearing on changes to the net energy billing tariff uh, prior to a vote. So um, I want to make very clear that I'm disappointed in the process that, that we went forward with today. Um, I think it is important that wherever possible that we allow for public hearing on language. That's why I tucked this into the bill uh, before sending it out at one o'clock yesterday. And I do want to draw the committee's attention to a number of uh, uh, written submissions pertaining to uh, the, this section of the bill that uh, are in our committee files. Um, I anticipate that, uh, you know, at this point in our day where we've deviated from the publicly advertised schedule, that there may be um, some members of the public who would hope to testify and feel that we've already dispensed with the issue. But I do hope that the committee, um, understanding its responsibility for um, conducting due diligence and for public input, uh, will take it on itself to look carefully at that testimony that has been filed on this issue and to, to make sure that in our vote on this bill that we try to be responsive to the input of stakeholders. Um, in particular, <laughs> um, I am learning that there are some issues that um, I think this language does not address. And um, in looking through the comments on this, uh, you know, I think I, I would wanna make a couple of small changes to this before we vote on it. Uh, but I do feel strongly that um, this uh, tariff rate reform, uh, although it's a valuable conversation, is one that we should not make without a uh, public hearing. And, um, you know, obviously we have that luxury now. We will not soon once the committee's work is done, but that's the reason for the inclusion of sections nine forward. So uh, that's the bill. I look forward to any hearing, any uh, public comments that uh, stakeholders may still be able to bring to any of those sections. And uh, it, it does have those different parts. So I, I trust that we'll hear um, comment on different portions and very much looking forward to that discussion. Happy to take any questions on the bill. Thank you, Representative Barry. Do members of the committee have questions for him? Seeing none, um, I guess the next thing, Jason, and again, I don't have access to these lists, but if you can let me know if there are any co-sponsors here to testify. Um, I don't see any on this one. Um, okay. We would have uh, Stephen Bunker as in favor if you want to move to the those who are in favor at this point. I think that makes sense. Uh, if you can bring Stephen over and it, can you just tell me who else is there? Uh, we've also got Gordon uh, Weil and Matt Kearns. I can bring over if you like. Okay, why don't we bring two over at a time, Stephen and Gordon, and we'll go from there. I see we already have Mr. Bunker here. Um, you need to unmute yourself, sir, and introduce yourself, and then please give us your testimony. Senator, in committee, with my apologies, <clears throat> my testimony was in reference to a 2016, not this particular legislation. It may have okay. been my, may have been my my error in in uh, entering on the on the database. So I'll stand by for for later. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that clarification. We'll look for you later on in today. Um, so Jason, who did you say the other uh, person to speak in favor of this bill? Um, there was Gordon Weil, but I, I don't have him in attendance right now. There was also uh, Matt Kearns, who is not in attendance. Oh, I'm sorry, I brought him <laughs> over already. Yep. <laughs> Matt Kearns is here, yeah. All right. So we'll go with Matt, since he is here. Mr. Kearns, please state your name and tell Thank us you. what you have to say. Thanks, Senator Vitelli, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Matt Kearns. I'm the Chief Development Officer from Long Road Energy. Um, we're mostly a grid scale developer, um, but we're in support of this uh, proposed amendment. Uh, appreciate the effort to kind of balance the um, repair impacts with the commitment to maintaining investment. 
um, that's already been taken on. We would like to um, make a couple of small language clarifications, um, and, and I think we can do we can do that later. Um, but appreciate all the efforts, and we're in support of the of the, uh, the amendment that uh, Representative Barry has brought forward in the in consultation with the GEO. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kearns. Are there questions from the committee? Representative Grohowski? Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Kearns, I apologize. I haven't had time to look at the testimony yet that's come from this bill, but those clarifications you discussed, are they in written testimony that we'll be able to reference through our portal? Yes, Representative Grohowski, yes. We uh, right. included those and they're, it's pretty limited. Um, it, it was just with respect to uh, being able to, if folks, if developers wanted to, if they actually preferred the um, fixed price uh, rate that, that they would have the ability to one time opt in uh, or, or whether there would just be by, by not submitting the affidavit, would that be uh, effectively uh, opting in? Uh, so just, just some sort of mechanics uh, on that, maybe similar to what the PUC asked about with respect to action they would have to take on. Uh, affidavits, that, that kind of uh, just mechanical stuff, I would say. Great. Thank you so much. I think it's helpful to have additional eyes on language like that to make sure we get the details right. Thank Further you. questions for Mr. Kearns? Seeing none, thank you for being with us for today, for your patience as we move through our busy agenda today. Um, and Jason, it looks like uh, Gordon Weil is back in the attendees room. If, if yes, I'll bring, bring him, him right over. Thank you. Well, we can see your big G there, but I'm not able to see you yet, and you are still muted. So if you can turn on your video, we'd be happy to hear from you. There you go. Now you look like you're all set. Good morning. Hello. We can hear you. You're all set to go, sir. Okay. So I, I'm ready to proceed. Yes, please. Uh, members of the committee, I'm testifying on the sponsor amendment provisions relating to local electric service options uh, for you, LD. Mr. Walken, you just state your name for us so people know. LD26. My name is Gordon Weil. I live in Harpswell. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay, um, I have submitted written testimony, which I hope you will be able to take a look at. My uh, point here is, uh, at its simplest, is this is a relatively uh, modest but, effect, but potentially effective piece of legislation because it says if you're going to have the members of a municipality decide to create uh, an electric service for themselves, they ought to have the principal responsibility for the decision. It should not be something where the voters can be overridden, uh, particularly by the Public Utilities Commission. On the other hand, the bill does not require anything to happen. It depends entirely on action of people in a municipality, one or more municipalities. Uh, so, uh, it is an enabling, it enables an option, but mandates nothing. Uh, the importance of it is twofold. One is it does give a municipal option for a very important public service, such as the legislature has given for many other kinds of activity where there are municipal options, whether they wish to or not, uh, take advantage of them. 
Uh, secondly, and importantly, there's a lot of attention at the moment being paid to utility accountability, particularly the two large investor-owned utilities. And there have been at least a couple of major ways proposed to uh, arrive at that accountability, arrive, to ensure that two problems which we have, cost and reliability, might be better dealt with than they are today. Uh, the, a potentially effective way to do this is by having uh, the competition that would be provided by the mere possibility of the creation of a municipal utility. Where that existed, the incumbent utility might feel it necessary to improve services to meet what the needs are that uh, lead a municipality to consider creating its own electric service. So as a result, you have a market solution for accountability, one that would take place as soon as this bill was passed uh, and not rely on, a, on lengthy and complicated uh, procedures which might not yield results for years. And the problem is obviously now. Doesn't mean that a single muni would be created necessarily, but the possibility of creating immunity would itself, a muni would itself have a potential impact. I would comment in looking at the discussion of this amendment, there's a lot more read into it than is there. There are a lot of things in state law that are not superseded by this. Uh, and that uh, there, this is modest. It accomplishes merely a process for the cre streamlining, enhancing, if you will, the process for the creation of a municipal utility or rural electrification co-op. But it doesn't. Well, it we're doesn't have to wrap up soon. I'll finish the sentence. Thank it you. does not impede. Uh, the uh, current operation of any utility or any of the powers of the regulator. Thank you, Mr. Weil. Are there questions from the committee? Representative Grohoski. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Weil, uh, for being here today. Um, one of the things I've thought about in terms of giving, you know, communities or, or groups of communities more choice in their energy future is, um, you know, I think one of the reasons they might be interested in that is service quality. Do you see that as a reason that should be considered uh, when looking to approve such a, a move from a CO, an IOU to a COU? Yes, but the people who should be doing the look at it, who should be looking, are the people who are getting the service. That's the difference. This isn't a question where three regulators in Augusta decide whether this will improve the service for people. People themselves would decide whether it would improve the service for them or whether they thought it would improve the service for them. And that, I think, is, is to be preferred. So uh, yes, it should deal with quality of service. It doesn't necessarily, I, I, just if I could give you one example, I did some work for a municipal utility in Vermont. Uh, the utility had the linemen of the incumbent, previous incumbent utility surrounding it. It was Northfield, Vermont, and the line work was done by Central Vermont Public Service. So the same people could do the line work but the interface with the customer, the rates, the cost of the utility, uh, the requirements of the level of service they wanted to provide for that cost was all done by elected representatives of the people. It, show, it shows that this, uh, that this can work uh, to do what the people wanted to do without grossly upsetting the world as we know it. 
Thank you. Are there further questions for Mr. Blau? Uh, if I may, Madam Chair, I have another question. <clears throat> Thank you. Go right ahead. Um, I'm sure you've given this sort of transition thought, and I'm curious, um, how do you see it being financed and um, and how do you see the compensation for the incumbent uh, to be determined? Well, the bill addresses the question of compensation. Certainly, it is not meant to be to impose a cost burden either on uh, the utility, it may uh, obviously not derive a profit from the operation of the muni, of the muni over time, but uh, it also won't be providing facilities or services to that uh, muni. So uh, the, it is a concomitant there. You have to pay attention to the fact that the reason why consumer owned utilities are left to do certain things is, they, is because they do it for themselves. The state doesn't do it for them. The regulator doesn't for, do it for them, but they get done. The same jobs get done and there is no cost to the customers of the IOU for the services that the co-op that the co-op or muni customers are getting from their own utility. And there's a tendency to make it sound like you're leaving costs behind. You're, you're not, you're taking the cost with you and you're taking the responsibility for paying those costs with you. Uh, so the utility should not be affected. In terms of how they would be financed, there are a lot of ways, but the simple way is there's no reason, and it occurs in Maine right now, that you could have a municipal utility, which is a department of municipal government. Municipal government has access to uh, raising funds. Uh, and so, uh, in a way, it's extremely easy. You don't have to look very far. Plus, there are organizations, say for co-ops, there is a national finance organization specifically for co-ops, the purpose of which is to assist in this kind of situation. That would be the lender. Obviously, this is all debt finance, no equity, no investment, no return on investment but they would be the lender to a, a new co-op. Munis very likely would do it through the municipality, but if not, there are lenders to munis. Uh, this, you know, you could say, well, how does the, you know, Podunk Water District get fun funded? It's about the same thing. It's, it, this is just another municipal service. That is that the municipality would choose to provide instead of having somebody else provide it. I would also point out that it's possible if it doesn't work, it can go back. We've had a couple of consumer-owned utilities that became parts of IOUs, so uh, the, it's really leaving it not to the regulator in Augusta, but to the regulator who pays for it. Thank you, Mr. Weil, and I will just. Um, let the committee know that I'm going to put the committee at ease for about 10 minutes. I unfortunately have another appointment I have to get to. I apologize Actually. to the committee and to members who are in the waiting. Oh, never mind. I think I can do something in addition. Our, our, I think Senator Lawrence is trying to rejoin with us. We'll give Senator it a minute. Vitelli, I'm back. Okay. <laughs> I thought that's what I was hearing, but I'm Senator not, Vitelli, I wasn't sure. So. Thank you, Senator Vitelli. I am. Senator Vitelli, can you hear me fine? I can, and it's all yours. Thank um, you. We were in the process of listening to other proponents of this legislation. Thank you very much. And thank you, Senator Vitelli. I had to uh, take my daughter to work. So um, I appreciate her pinching in and allowing me to do that. And we are back and I believe we're on the second person testifying in favor of this bill, um, Gordon Weil. And I'd ask the committee if there are any other questions for Mr. Weil. I don't, oops, 
two more, um, Representative Barry. You need to unmute yourself. I was Senator. muted, I apologize. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Dr. Weil, it's good to see you. Um, I am um, very appreciative of your lending your, your extensive expertise as always to this committee. Um, I, I wanted to just ask you about the, um, the, the, the question of power supply and whether that might also be implicated here. Well, yes, it's quite different. As a matter of fact, the, the rules that apply for the power, as everybody on this committee knows, the two major elements of the utility bill are the wires and the power supply. And for the investor-owned utilities, the power supply is obtained independently, um, very heavily by the standard offer, uh, which changes uh, with the market. Uh, and then there's the wire side. Uh, the consumer-owned utilities do not have to go through the PUC for power supply. They can make their own arrangements, and they generally make longer-term, uh, more stable arrangements for power supply. But they are able to do that, which the IOUs are not able to do. It. There's a, I won't go into it. When restructuring took place, there was an arrangement made where each side got rights the other side didn't get. Uh, and that was a right that went to the POUs. The net result is that you've seen a very significant increase in electric rates this year uh, for the IOUs where they are tracking the fuel cost for generation heavily in New England, which is mostly natural gas. Uh, and that hasn't happened to the same extent or at all in some cases for the consumer owned utilities, which entered into longer term arrangements when prices were desirable to do that and are riding this out without rate increases. So the nature of main law, which distinguishes how a utility obtains or conveys power supply, depending upon the type of utility it is, is significant and can produce and generally has produced uh, a lower cost for consumer owned utilities than uh, the incumbent investor utilities. Thank you. Thank you, any follow-up question, Representative Barry? I'll hold tight for now, thank you. Representative Kessler, you had a question for Mr. Weil. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Weil. Afternoon, actually, good afternoon. Um, I, I was wondering how can, or how do small utilities go about um, contracting for the actual operating services, like actually getting up to speed doing that? Well, uh, some of them do it themselves. They don't contract, they hire people and, and carry out the operating services on their own. Uh, but they may contract, and that's done usually by going out to uh, one of two ways that I know of frequently, going out to bid. And there are now companies, uh, in fact, I read about one in the Bangor Daily News two days ago, a new company in Maine, that provides line services, an independent company, not, not uh, um, associated with an existing utility. Uh, so you could hire their people to do the work, or you could hire uh, uh, people from the incumbent utilities. I mentioned the case of uh, Northfield, Vermont. That's what we did. They had the lowest rates in the state of Vermont uh, for power supply and uh, were and simply contracted for the services from the neighboring uh, IOU. So that's, uh, you know, that's a, a way to do it. Plus, you can receive a lot of assist, uh, assistance from the Northeast Public Power Association, practical assistance. This is not a discussion group. This is a group that runs courses, does safety inspections, uh, does hands-on with uh, utility operating personnel and small utilities all over the Northeast, all over New England. 
So uh, that's available. If you think about it, consumer-owned utilities are likely to be smaller than investor-owned utilities. So to realize economies of scale, they get together. Uh, they join together and create organizations that can provide services across a number of small utilities. And, and uh, as a result, that happens with engineering services. There are engineering firms that specialize in doing this kind of work for COUs. Uh, so there is a, a range of services that are available to consumer-owned utilities in recognition of the fact they need to be buying from a pooled resource. I don't know what what happens now, but uh, years ago, I remember that Eastern Maine Co-op's billing is actually done out of a central system in Missouri, uh, but all of their, which works for co-ops all over the place. So they don't have to run a billing operation themselves in Cali. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. That kind of thing uh, is available. And, and so there's a wide range of choice. And we see that in Maine. I and mean, we do have functioning consumer-owned utilities in Maine. This is not something that doesn't happen. Uh, and, and this is how they do it. Other questions for Mr. Weil? I'm sorry, Representative Barry. Thank you, um, Dr. Weil. Uh, the question of compensation, I just wonder if you could briefly put a, a fine point on um, whether in any way, shape or form, uh, the language before us might uh, run up against the takings clause of the US Constitution. No, I, I think they have to be compensated. I mean, not, I would not uh, advocate that somehow a municipality could just take over the facilities of the incumbent utility without compensation. Uh, I, I haven't seen that kind of thing happening anywhere. There would have to be compensation and there would have to be a judgment made about what's fair compensation and that judgment in the bill is not made by the people who are paying it. That judgment is made by the PUC and potentially ultimately by the courts. Uh, and that's pretty much normal. That's what we've seen where uh, the compensation that must be paid, uh, that, that A, compensation must be paid, and B, that uh, it is not made by the people who are paying it, but by a third party that can ultimately make a fair judgment about what ought to be paid. It's not a simple question, as everybody knows. Uh, it's heavily debated when the situation arises, but it's always resolved. There's always an answer at the end of the process. Follow-up question, Representative Barry. Thank you. Yes, uh, just very briefly. Um, do our courts in Maine, Dr. Weil, have experience with establishing the value of utility assets? Well, I think they have, uh, yeah, I think there was a very well-known case where a central Maine power tried to take over Maine public service when it existed uh, as an independent utility. And so, uh, and that was ultimately uh, decided at the, uh, uh, at the uh, law court. Uh, so there obviously was experience there. Uh, and there were in the regulatory process questions about uh, what the economics of a merged utility would look like. And there was a lot of attention at that time paid to the question of uh, the economics of one utility taking over another. So, and, and it's not new. I mean, there's an awful lot of literature about this. This isn't the court that did it to be specific to your question, but clearly this, this is a known issue. And uh, I was involved in a case uh, actually on behalf of the state where I was the state's expert with regard to the Long Falls Dam, which was built by Central Maine Power uh, created Flagstaff Lake. And the question was, what was its value? Uh, 
Uh, and there's a methodology for that. And, and that, that was ultimately, I gave my opinion to the state, CMP challenged it, and I'm pleased to say the law court agreed with me. Uh, and so the state was paid accordingly. So there, there, yeah, there's knowledge and experience on these kinds of matters. Thank you very much. That's it for me, Mr. Chair. Okay, other questions for Mr. Weil? Seeing none, um, thank you very much. Uh, this completes our testimony, I believe, of people in favor of the bill. Uh, we'll be going uh, shortly to people against. I'll ask Jason that you bring over Steve Hudson and Jeff Sparrow. And while you're doing that, I just wanted to, um, to speak briefly to comments that were made earlier, kind of out of order on this bill. And I was very disappointed those comments were raised about the process. Um, they really tried to raise red herrings. They were false and they were unfounded and they're confusing to the public about this process. Nothing that has happened in this process today is any different than has happened on any other committee during, during the legislative session. They were well communicated to all members of the committee. I communicated it publicly yesterday morning when uh, Senator Stewart wanted to bring forward his amendment. Um, I communicated in caucus to our caucus members and it was communicated again this morning. So nothing, nothing was a surprise to anyone. Um, what we're seeing now is <clears throat> someone trying to take the amendment Senator Stewart offered and merge it with a whole bunch of different ideas. Their motive may be to try to get support for those other ideas by putting Senator Stewart's amendment in that. And every member of the committee is welcome to do that. But if Mr. anybody- Chair, I, I believe it, it's, it's out of order. Barry, I'm speaking point, right now. Point, point of Barry, order. A point of order. Jason, could you turn off? Your point of order, Representative Perry. My point of order is, I believe it's out of order to question the motives of a fellow legislator. Okay, I'll withdraw that. If anybody has a concern about <clears throat> how this is being done, I'm more than willing to sit down with them at any time with the presiding officers to discuss it at any time. So there's nothing in here that allowed, and I wanna speak to Mr. Buxton's comments earlier in this process um, about not being able to publicly testify during a work session. And we've repeated it many times in this process that people can submit written testimony for a work session, which can be done. I know people know this who are experienced testifiers in the legislature, know this process and know how to do that as a work session. So I hope we're not gonna spend time talking about how people have been denied access to the process because they haven't been. But if any committee member feels that way, I'm more than willing to sit down with the presiding officers and discuss that. So we'll go on to discuss the people um, against and I'll recognize Mr. Hudson. Mr. Hudson sent over an email saying he would uh, be speaking neither for nor against at this point. And I brought okay. over Jeffrey, Jeffrey Sparrow as, Thank as you. against, yeah. Okay, Mr. Sparrow, why don't you proceed? Thank you, uh, good afternoon, Chair Lawrence, Representative Barry and members of the EUT committee. Um, my name is Jeff Sparrow. I was born in Maine and I live in Maine with my wife and two daughters. I've been working in Maine solar industry for 16 years and I'm currently the vice president of development for Green Lantern Solar. I am testifying against this bill specifically to the section pertaining to the net energy billing tariff rate change. Here we are again. Just one year ago, this committee made its best efforts to curtail investment in Maine's net energy billing program. As a result, projects were killed, investors have lost interest in our state, and developers have had to pivot our business models on short notice with projects that take many years to de develop. Attrition is much more than we thought it would be a year ago and is well over 50%. In many cases, it is taking three plus years to even get a project through interconnection. This bill is a solution to a problem. And sorry, this bill is in search of a problem that does not exist. It is not necessary. The program is working. 
The rate design of this program was well thought out when it was put in place. The only reason we are here today is because the supply portion of our electricity costs have gone way up due to the world market natural gas constraints. Proponents of this bill are claiming that 100% of the solar tariff payments are costs. This is not accurate. No one is accounting for the fact that a kilowatt hour produced by solar offsets the need to purchase a kilowatt hour from regional suppliers. Deployment of solar is one of the few ways that Maine can produce domestic energy and reduce our dependence on natural gas derived electricity. Tariff rates will go down if and when the supply portion of electricity costs go down. If we were all back in 2020, this bill would look great. However, in the past two years, we have experienced rapid inflation and our economy and construction costs have increased by 24%, putting many projects under development in the red. If the rate design is to be changed, it should be tied to actual costs of electricity and construction in the year that a project goes into service. The consumer price index is one example of that. A fixed escalator after that date is reasonable. The September safe harbor date change is helpful and will save some late stage projects from being turned on their head as would have happened with an April 1st cutoff. So thank you for making that change in the bill. However, this does nothing to prevent future projects from collapsing. The attrition of projects is more severe than we had predicted just a year ago. Utility interconnection timelines, cluster studies and costs are an absolute disaster and would be great issues for this committee to focus on. This bill is a knee jerk reaction to what is happening in a volatile world economy. Please do not create yet another headwind to solar project development in Maine. Let's save rate redesign for NEB 2.0. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the committee for Mr. Sparrow? Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Sparrow, I just wanna say I appreciate your testimony. And um, can you say a little more about the, uh, the, the investments that, that you make of your time and money that you're concerned about um, that would be um, potentially lost if, if we were to go forward with this language? Um, yeah, sure. It, you know, developing a project, getting it to kind of NTP, what we talk about ready to build, um, costs, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars through um, local, state, and federal permitting, interconnection costs, et cetera. Um, you know, Assumptions have been made on these projects early in their process about what rates are and construction costs are. Uh, that, that obviously changes over time. Um, those decisions were made on the data we had used available at that time. Um, and we are basically talking about changing the calculus uh, for that data. Um, so, you know, what was a smart decision a while ago with a rule change in front of us was actually a poor decision. You know, we can't. We are trying to look forward two, three, four years. Um, so having these changes done midstream uh, really just is a challenge. Thanks, Mr. Sparrow. Any this other is... questions for Mr. Sparrow? Thank you. Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. I believe that um, completes the people testifying against. Mr. Hudson indicated he would testify neither for nor against. So um, I will go to him now if he's still there. And next will be uh, Jessica Robertson. Do we have Mr. Hudson there? Go ahead, Steve. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Senator Lawrence. Uh, Senator Lawrence, uh, Representative Barry and members of the EUT committee, I. Uh, and Stephen Hudson, attorney with Pretty Flaherty. I'm here today on behalf of Eastern Maine Electric Cooperative, or EMEC, testifying neither for nor against LD 1026. So specifically, uh, EMEC is just going to speak about uh, the, uh, the sections of the bill um, that relate to uh, uh, municipal utilities and, and, and COUs ex expansion, which are pretty much, I think, sections three through I'm sure I got it right, um, eight of the bill. Um, and specifically, our, com uh, our comments are <clears throat> limited to thanking the sponsor. Um, when we have seen um, 
prior attempts to address this issue that the, that the sponsor mentioned. It has included um, the, the possibility that a COU like EMAC might get um, poached um, because we have a unique situation of a very large service territory, <coughs> excuse me, very large service <laughs> territory with, uh, uh, with a few large population centers, but a lot of miles of rural lines that we maintain. So to us, we, we had some concern about the prior versions. This version of, of, of this proposal appears to take our concerns into account. We thank the sponsor for that. We would note in section eight um, that this section refers to, uh, the language refers to section 3772 uh, and, it, and it proposes to be section 3773 of, the, of uh, chapter 35A. Those sections occur under a subchapter related to an entity called a, a, uh, a consumer owned generation and transmission uh, utility. Uh, EMAC is not a generation and transmission utility. It is a transmission utility. Um, we're not aware that there is one. I mean, it was good that Maine law provided the possibility, but we're not aware that there is one uh, character like this. We suggest that, that um, uh, that in fact, uh, that the reference to 3772 be deleted, section 2102 is sufficient. And that we suggest that, that uh, this entire language be transferred into uh, the prior subchapter under uh, C uh, COU Cooperative Powers and would, would become, I think it's section, I'm gonna get the number right, 3756. And, and so that's our suggestion, uh, uh, I think a very minor technical amendment and again, we're happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much, Ms. Hudson. Are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. We'll go on to Jessica Robertson from Borrego Solar, and the next will be Candy Terry from NRG Energy, Inc. Are you there, Jessica? Um, I, I, none. The next person that is on the list that is in attendance would appear to be um, William Harwood. Okay, let's go to the public advocate. Is Steve Weems here? Yes. Okay, why don't you bring Steve over? And is Caitlin still here? Yes. Okay, after Steve will be Caitlin and then Dan Burgess after that. If anybody um, prior on the list shows up, um, just let me know and we can bring them over to testify. Okay. So we'll go to the public advocate, William Harwood. Good afternoon, Senator Lawrence, Representative Berry, members of the committee. I am the public advocate testifying neither for nor against. This bill has a lot of pieces in it, so I wasn't quite sure where I landed. Um, sections one and two, I want to thank Representative Berry. It's always nice to clean up the statutes where we can, and I think that's a helpful suggestion. And as I indicated to the committee earlier this morning, uh, the Office of Public Advocate supports sections nine and 10. The reason I'm not supporting the bill is sections three through eight. And this is a significant policy question that I worry about and urge the committee to go very carefully with this. I'm not sure at this late stage of the session, it's a good idea to be getting into this. And the problems with it are, are multiple. First, the question of breaking up a utility will inevitably leave stranded costs, costs that were designed for the large utility. When a utility engages in planning and investment, it is constantly looking at all of its customers, all of its load, and trying to optimize or right size the staffing and the facilities. If you remove a piece of that utility, it is no longer right size and will have surplus assets and surplus staffing that will need to be adjusted. That's a real cost that we can't ignore. Now, the proponents of the bill have pointed out that the investors will be compensated for the private property that is taken from them. And that's all well and good. I'll get to that in a minute. But what I'm talking about as the ratepayer advocate is the other ratepayers of the utility that are left behind. 
and whether or not they should be expected to pick up the stranded costs that are created by breaking up the utility. In my view, it would be best if the municipality that went forward with this was also obligated to reimburse the utility for any of the stranded costs that were incurred as a result of the breakup. The great payers of that utility shouldn't be the ones who are on the hook for these uh, costs that are created simply by taking one utility and breaking it up into two separate utilities. The other piece is the just compensation. This is an area of constitutional dimensions as been referenced earlier. And the question <clears throat> that I have not had a chance to research as to whether or not it is okay to delegate a question as important as the taking of private property to an administrative agency like the PUC is not clear. I have, during my career in private practice, one of the few uh, lawyers that has actually litigated eminent domain cases that where a public consumer-owned utility has condemned and acquired the assets of an investor-owned utility. The last one I did was in front of a jury in Ellsworth. There may well be an argument that the investors of an investor-owned utility that are being deprived of their property and are entitled to just compensation may have the right to bring that in front of a main jury in superior court. So there's a lot going on here. This is very tricky stuff. It's not easy. It has constitutional dimensions. And most importantly, for those ratepayers who are not going to the new utility, but are left behind at the old utility, that's my principal concern. We have to be very careful that those people aren't being financially harmed as a result of this. So I will stop there and happy to take, try and answer any questions. Are there questions from the committee for Mr. Harwood? I don't see any, thank you very much. I think next is Stephen Weems and then uh, Caitlin Kelly O'Neill. Thank you, Senator Lawrence. Uh, uh, and Senator Lawrence, Representative Berry, and other members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology. My name is Steve Weems. I'm the Executive Director of the Solar Energy Association, Maine. I apologize for not yet submitting written testimony. I will do so. Uh, the association is neither for nor against the, the whole bill because it has these multiple parts. We are opposed to sections eight and nine. And just note that the horse has already apparently left the barn on that. And others have already covered the key points on those sections of the bill, um, either testifying right here or earlier. So I'll just leave that behind. Uh, the association supports section three through eight as very desirable to support the successful operation of local municipal power districts or cooperatives, which have been a highly successful model in Maine and elsewhere and have been thwarted from rationalizing their service districts right here in Maine. So for this reason, we support those sections of the bill and in the interest of time, I'll conclude my comments there and thank you for your service and consideration of that aspect of the bill. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Mr. Weems from the committee? Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. 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 Weems. I, uh, I, I, I appreciate the term rationalizing districts. I, I think um, that's a, that's a great way to think about this. Are there specific areas where um, you or other members of the association um, might be aware of, of a need for, for uh, a more rational or self-determined approach? Uh, well, thank you for the question. I'm gonna use that as an opportunity to speak uh, from another chair. I, but I do have a good example that I'll just mention briefly here that might put some, uh, make some, might be an interesting example. I was a trustee 
but the Mid Coast Regional Redevelopment Authority, which was is developing the former Naval Air Station, over 2,000 acres of property. And I'm on the, the Brunswick uh, Recycling and Sustainability Committee, which has a, a goal of beneficial electrification among other parts of its mission. The Mid Coast Regional Redevelopment Authority essentially is already a consumer owned utility on its, on its property. It's a municipality by definition even though it doesn't have all the powers of most uh, municipalities, uh, but it is a municipal corporation. It has land and it already has quite a commitment to clean energy. It has a uh, anaerobic digester on it and a five megawatt, excuse me, a 1.5 megawatt solar array uh, for its own tenants. The town has its own objectives it's not a huge leap of faith to say that that asset at the formal Naval Air Station could be expanded into a townwide uh, municipal uh, utility district to satisfy, particularly with the land available, so that the town could satisfy its clean energy objectives, and it would be under current law, almost impossible to do that. And under the provisions in this bill, that would open up an avenue for that kind of beneficial development. Thank you very much. Other questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Weems. Thank you. Um, and we have Caitlin Kelly O'Neill and then Dan Burgess. Um, Caitlin, did you have testimony you wanted to offer on this bill? Yes, uh, thank you, Senator Lawrence. Um, so good afternoon, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee. I'm Caitlin Kelly O'Neill, the Northeast Regional Director for the Coalition for Community Solar Access. Uh, CCSA is testifying as neither for nor against this bill. Um, for sections one through eight, uh, we are not taking any position and my comments are primarily in relation to sections nine and 10. Um, I offered comments on this to the committee earlier today, um, so I won't repeat that, but other, other than to say we are supportive of this and appreciate the work done by Director Burgess and the GEO on this. Um, I did just want to comment on some of the discussion that was had earlier today regarding um, the Public Utilities Commission's discretionary review of the statements and affidavits submitted by projects that are, are stating that they meet the the construction deadline by September 1st um, in the bill. We would urge the committee to retain the original language that um, a, a notarized affidavit as submitted by a project uh, sponsor is sufficient to, to meet the criteria as established. Um, there's just concern that if there is discretionary review that may, that, that inserts a level of uncertainty here that frankly the uh, project owners and project developers uh, would like to avoid. Um, they they know, they're familiar with this IRS definition. They know whether they meet the criteria. Um, a notarized affidavit is a very high bar to pass. Um, you know, they're swearing that they, that what they are submitting is true. And so we would just urge the committee to um, retain that original language, um, or if they're is a necessary strengthening of language that it, it be around uh, the, the notarized sworn statement um, rather than any sort of discretionary re review. So thank you for um, my con your consideration of these comments. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee for Ms. Kelly O'Neill? Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Kelly O'Neill, thank you for your testimony. And I wonder, um, if you could comment on the problem of cluster studies. I know that they can take, you know, five to seven years. Um, many projects that are, you know, currently awaiting cluster studies, you know, have made significant investments of time and resources. Um, do you view this bill as, as sufficiently um, uh, considerate of that concern? Is there a need for some kind of a safety valve? Thank you, Representative. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned this morning in, in my statement made, um, 
we it, we are very appreciative of the language in the bill that changes the the requirement for that 2024 deadline to be a mechanical completion rather than commercial operation. Um, we we would appreciate some additional consideration given to projects that may be waiting for many years beyond 2024 for the utility related construction to be completed. Um, and if there, if there is already some language within LD 936 regarding good cause and the safe harbor criteria, some clarity um, that allows those projects to know that if you know, when they're coming out of cluster studies, there are basically two main considerations that could impact whether or not they're able to proceed. The first is cost, um, and the second is schedule. Obviously, if the cost that that project is going, if that, that, that project is being assessed is too high, they're not going to be able to move forward. That's, that's one of the biggest contributors to the high levels of attrition that Jeremy Payne referenced earlier today. However, if they are able to, um, to accommodate the cost, but they're still waiting on a fairly long construction timeline, then giving them some leeway regarding that 2024 deadline, you know, they, they would otherwise be able to move forward, but this enables them to not have to construct the project now and then have the essentially the the project sitting idle, um, you know, in a field possibly for a number of years while the utility related construction it still needs to be completed. So, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier today that we would appreciate some further consideration granted um, in relation to that. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, Representative Barry. Yeah, two quick follow-ups. Um, did I, I apologize I had something come up at work and uh, wasn't here for the vote so maybe this was taken care of uh, earlier today um, in a previous bill but the question of um, inflation um, you know a project that uh, you know in particular a project that <clears throat> you know is is kind of uh, started today or based on 2020 rates if it's if it's you know, not operational until 2024 um, have we have we appropriately addressed uh, the, the matter of inflation here in this bill or um, do we need to change it in, in this? I'll stick to this bill. Sure. Um, so the, the current language has um, an escalator rate of 2.25%. Um, we're, we're satisfied with that, with that escalator rate. Great. And the second start, question, Representative Barry. Thank you. And the start date for the escalator rate is okay as well? Yes. Thank you. One last question, uh, if I may, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Representative Barry. Is around the um, two megawatt versus uh, under two megawatt definition. Um, it's my understanding from another uh, solar company who unfortunately had to go that uh, there's one section of statute where um, although it's fixed in other places, there may be a section where <laughs> there still needs to be some clarity around um, two or less versus under two. Um, so would, would it be important for us to be consistent in that regard? So as the language that's currently before the Committee for Consideration is consistent with previous language as established um, through LD 936 passed last year. Um, you know, we understand that there, there may be further discussions that happen through this, the 2.0 stakeholder group. Um, and we're very happy to engage in those discussions, you know, with that group. But for now, the, the current language is, is consistent with what has been established. Any follow-up questions, Representative Barry? Yes, and I apologize. Just to just to clarify, so um, it's your understanding that it's it's consistent across the statute of the state that that uh, that it's two or under. That's yes, that is my understanding because that as okay. according can, to the language that was passed last year, you know that is in relation to two to five megawatt projects under mm -hmm. two can continue to move forward. And nothing in this language um, makes adjustments to that. And I think it's the two or under versus under Any, two that matters. 
Um, so I'll just thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Just ask, the, ask our uh, committee analysts to help us to, to make sure we're consistent across. Okay. The thank, you. thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Kelly O'Neill? Seeing none, thank you very much. And then we'll go to Dan Burgess from the Governor's Energy Office. I, I believe uh, they decided to pro provide written testimony and not speak. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. And just to check before we conclude the hearing, Jessica Robinson, Candy Terry, Patrick Jackson, and Lars Gunderson are not here to testify. Is that correct? In person, but they may have submitted written testimony. That's that's what I see as well. Yeah, that's, okay. that's correct. Thank you. So I believe we've concluded all the people testifying on this legislation. So I'll declare the public hearing on this bill closed. Our next public hearing is also a bill by Representative Barry. I believe it's a concept draft. It's called LD 1511 um, to uh, finance distribution. Uh, investments of the um, lowest cost to customers and to encourage utility performance. I'll recognize the sponsor of the bill, Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Lawrence, members of the committee. Um, it is good to be with you uh, still to uh, present this bill, LD 1511, and the sponsor amendment. Um, this is a language actually that many of you and many stakeholders have seen. It's been um, kicking around for some time and I felt that it was important that we you know, bring it out of the open for discussion. Uh, the, the purpose of this bill would be, as the title suggests, to um, create greater access to lower cost capital. And um, specifically that's low cost capital in terms of how we finance our transmission and distribution infrastructure. As we beneficially electrify uh, and increase perhaps three, four, five X, the amount of electricity that is flowing through our grid, we will need to, need to make very substantial investments in the grid. Uh, for most Mainers, that capital will come at a cost, uh, as the committee knows, in the order of 9%. Um, based on a 50-50 split of equity and debt. And it is also possible, as we know from our consumer and utilities to finance infrastructure at a much lower cost of capital, uh, currently in the order of two to 3%. So less than half the cost. And, you know, I think, I think that the um, other thing that, that uh, that savings could allow is greater compensation of the utilities for their operations of the grid. You know, one of the uh, purposes here is also to have some money left over to properly compensate uh, performance and specifically performance in operations and maintenance, which as we know is currently a pass-through. Um, so we're rewarding um, CapEx and we're um, not rewarding uh, operations and maintenance. That has to do with uh, Supreme Court precedents that none of us can change, but we can change the way that we finance things uh, in this way. The bill would do as follows. It would uh, uh, create a definition for a tax-exempt third-party entity and allow that tax-exempt third-party entity, as you see in section two, um, excuse me, section, uh, section three of the bill to um, apply to the commission uh, for the commission's permission to finance and own a distribution project that had gone through the non-Myers alternatives process. The NWA process currently is really about alternatives to transmission, you know, as the name suggests, non-wires. Um, in this case, the, uh, the process would be used to allow for a discrete project to be financed uh, using this tax exempt lower cost capital. So the tax exempt third party entity would ask the commission for permission. Uh, if the commission uh, decided to allow this approach, then the, uh, uh, the, the non-marginal alternatives process would unfold as it always does. 
And perhaps the outcome would be that the NWA was approved and um, it, it would that would go forward as it normally does. If, however, the NWA alternative is not approved um, and it is a wires alternatives that the commission decides is in the best interest of the public, then the tax exempt third party entity, the low cost capital option would come into play. The proposal uh, from the tax exempt third party entity would be submitted to the commission. Uh, that entity would be proposing to finance and own the, the wires project, the distribution project. And the commission would then decide, is this in the interest of ratepayers? Does this save money for ratepayers or not? So they would, they would exercise full control they would first decide whether it was even in the public interest to allow a proposal to come forward. And then they would decide whether the proposal was um, in the interest of ratepayers. Operations in part two, uh, excuse me, uh, part, section three, part two, um, operations would be by the utility itself. They would continue to be involved in the planning, the development, the um, the operations, the maintenance of the project, only the check uh, would be written by a different entity. And the ownership uh, deed would be, would be held by a different entity. The commission would ensure that the utility is properly compensated for that work. This is very important. So again, you're, you're financing this at half the cost, perhaps less than half the cost, if the commission decides to go forward with it. And some of that money that's left over would be used under part three of, of section three, would be used for the, oh, oh, the uh, proper, even enhanced compensation to the utility for their performance in planning, in development, in operations, in maintenance, the service to ratepayers. So we would be shifting, if you will, from um, simply rewarding uh, a CapEx to rewarding performance. And uh, the rate design would also need to provide for uh, payment in lieu of taxes to municipality, county, or other political subdivision. If the committee sees fit, we can just call that a, a straight up property tax. I'm not too particular on that point. Um, the commission can adopt rules and the uh, utility would also um, need to comply with you know, this approach if the commission decided that it was in the public interest. So that's uh, sections one through three. In addition, I have included in the bill um, some language that uh, pertains to competitive bidding by investor-owned utilities. Currently, uh, although they are public utilities, um, and I emphasize public, um, we do not treat utilities um, as being required to engage in competitive bidding to save their customers money. We do that uh, for other public entities. Um, Schools are required to use competitive bidding. State government is required to use competitive bidding. County government is required to use competitive bidding. Um, Quasi-governmental entities are required to use competitive bidding. The main turnpike authority uh, and, and others, um, universities. So public entities as a general rule in Maine law need to use competitive bidding. That's, um, I, th I think we can all agree that that's appropriate and logical. Um, sole source bidding can be rife with opportunities for corruption. It can be rife with opportunities to inflate expenses, um, which uh, unfortunately doing because of the way that uh, utilities are compensated under the Hope and Bluefield standard can be very problematic. And um, competitive bidding uh, is good for the goose. So um, I believe it's also good for the gander and that our public utilities should be required to engage in it as well. And that is the, the um, kind of second half of the bill there in uh, sections um, six, uh, four, five, and six. Finally, um, there is also a review uh, by the commission of laws and rules um, just to make sure that um, the 
the, the uh, measures that are undertaken here are um, uh, substantially similar to the requirements for a governing body of entities under Title V that are subject to competitive bidding now. Um, that's it for my presentation of the bill. I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Are there are questions from the committee for Representative Barry. Seeing none, thank you very much, Representative. And then I believe we only have one person to testify on this bill. And if I am correct, it is Stephen Weems. Yes, uh, Stephen Weems from the Solar Energy Association. So if you could bring him across, Jason, I'd appreciate it. S Senator Lawrence, um, Deidre let me know that she, the PUC is here as well, if, if you oh, want to. Oh, thank you. Yep. Do they want to testify? They do. Okay, so we'll hear first from Stephen Weems, and then do you know if they're going to be testifying either for or against, or? I, I don't know. Okay, I'll find out. If you bring Mr. Weems over, he's in favor. We'll deal with him first. Okay. I'm here, Senator Lawrence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead thanks. and identify yourself and, um, and present your testimony. Thank you. I'll be brief. Um, uh, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, other members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities and Technology. My name is Steve Weems, Executive Director of the Solar Energy Association of Maine. Again, I apologize for not having submitted written testimony and will do so. Um, association supports LD 1511 as an important reform to encourage the enthusiastic implementation of non-wire alternative projects. The legislature long ago determined that it is unrealistic to expect the investor-owned utilities to perform this function, which is why it's, it, it embedded the non-wires alternative analysis in the OPA. And this is just a logical follow-on as we see it to implement viable non-wires alternative projects. So we'll leave it at that and um, hope that you'll consider this bill favorably. Thank you. Are there questions from the committee for Mr. Weems? Seeing none, oh, Representative Barry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Weems without uh, prolonging this too much. Um, does the association consider the, uh, the current structure as required under Hope and Bluefield to be problematic in the sense that uh, we reward um, capital expenditures rather than performance and, and good planning and execution? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Reams? Seeing none, thank you very much. And uh, the Public Utilities Commission had in indicated they wanted to testify neither for nor against. So why don't you beam them across, uh, Jason? Okay, and the uh, OPA just got a hold of me as well, and they'd like to testify if that's okay. possible. That's fine. Uh, why don't you bring them both over? Deirdre, is it you who are going to be presenting the testimony? Yes, Senator Lawrence. Okay. <laughs> um, go ahead, introduce yourself, and uh, present your testimony. Sure, and I'll be pretty brief. So Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology. I'm Deirdre Schneider, the Legislative Liaison at the Public Utilities Commission here to testify neither for nor against the sponsor's amendment to LD 1511. We haven't had the opportunity at this time to really discuss or analyze this proposal. Um, we think that it may be worth further exploration with the Office of the Public Advocate and the non wires alternative team to determine if this is workable. And we will take a more thorough look at this and be ready to discuss this further at work session and offer any comments or concerns we may have. We appreciate the time. Thank you. Senator Lawrence, you're muted. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much, Deirdre. And we'll go to uh, Bill Harwood. Thank you, Senator Lawrence, Representative Berry, members of the committee. I am the public advocate uh, testifying neither for nor against LD 1511. Unfortunately, we've had very little time to study this proposal. 
but it does appear to raise two very significant and substantial issues of utility finance and utility regulation. First, the, the tax exempt feature. Uh, I applaud uh, Representative Berry's attempts to get at tax exempt financing. Utilities have been working at that for decades. It's a very tricky area. It is not one that uh, I, I or anyone in my office is certainly qualified uh, to uh, in, uh, opine on, but the idea that these assets are gonna be under the control of an investor owned utility, but are gonna be financed with a tax exempt financing vehicle is something that it is, uh, will be pushing the envelope. And I would urge the committee, if they really are gonna get into this bill this session to find qualified bond counsel who could give uh, much better advice than I can on the question of whether this will really work. The second feature is the competitive bidding. Um, in a hundred years of utility regulation, we have not required utilities, whether they be IOUs or COUs or water districts or whatever to engage in competitive bidding. We hope that competitive bidding is used routinely by utilities where appropriate, but it is a very different policy to mandate it. Uh, it requires some additional thought and consideration. There are times when the utilities simply don't have the luxury, the time and the uh, difficulty and cumbersomeness of going through what we would expect of a state agency to engage in com competitive bidding. You can easily imagine the storm barreling down, the hurricane barreling down on the service territory and the question of whether or not there's going to be have to be competitive bidding to line up some additional contractors to assist in restoring power. It just may not be a, a practical solution. So what I'm not saying no, never uh, to any of these ideas. They're interesting. They probably deserve more consideration. But at this point, I can't support them because I think they really require some very careful, thoughtful additional analysis that I, I'm not sure we have time for at this stage of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harwood. Any questions for the public advocate? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. I think this concludes- Sen Senator, our La Senator yes. Lawrence, we have one other person that would like to testify, James Cody, if you're interested in hearing from okay. them. Why don't you bring uh, Mr. Cody over? Let me know, James, when you're here. He should be here in a second. Okay. I'm here, apologies, Senator Lawrence. Great, thank you, James. Why don't you introduce yourself, tell us where you're from and go ahead with your testimony. Sure. And let and us I will... know if you're, if you're gonna be testifying in favor, against, or neither for nor against. Sure, uh, I appreciate that. And I will keep this very brief. Um, uh, good afternoon, Senator Lawrence, represent Barry and members of the committee. My name is James Cody. I'm employed by Bernstein Shore, live in Farmington, Maine, and I'm here today in opposition to LD 1511 on behalf of Versa Power. Uh, at, at a very minimum, we would just like to echo uh, the comments that you just heard from the Office of the Public Advocate. We think those are significant considerations that the committee should take into, uh, into account. Um, but we also just wanted to flag a very fundamental question uh, in regards to this proposal, which is the issue of safety and liability. Um, again, you know, recognizing the comments that were made by Mr. Harwood, this is not a never can happen type of testimony, but we are very concerned that introducing uh, the potential of a third party into the distribution system who would own and maintain this infrastructure could pose significant safety and liability issues. 
And we believe that before the committee were to move forward with this bill, those issues, uh, which we believe are paramount, should be uh, fully considered and understood uh, before a decision is made. Um, that, that said, I can conclude my testimony um, maybe by lastly just saying uh, that section six, we sort of perceive as undermining the, the role and the discretion that the PUC has to regulate the prudently or imprudently incurred costs by any utility. Um, and uh, Senator Lawrence and other attorneys may know this better than I do, but uh, you know, there is some question about how the Administrative Procedures Act could apply to a private entity. Uh, and that being said, I'll, I'll conclude. Thank you for your consideration. I know you have a long day and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the committee for Ms. Cody? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank okay, you, Senator. So are, we, are we at the end of people who want to testify on this bill? Uh, yes, no one else has notified me. Okay, thank you. So I'll conclude the uh, public testimony on this bill. Uh, we're going to be breaking for lunch for an hour. Uh, we will be back at um, 2.10, and we'll be hearing the next three bills, um, 2.15, 2.16, and 2.17. So if you could all turn off your video, turn off your microphone, and we'll see you in an hour. Thank you.
Okay, it looks like we may have one, two, three, four, five, six back. I'm just gonna give it another second to see who we get back. It's like we probably have seven back. So I think uh, I'm comfortable getting started again. And the, where you're back with the um, Energy Utilities and Technology Committee, we're completing our hearings for today. And we have three bills coming out of that our, our committee bills were reported out and they are LB 215, 216 and 217. We're gonna hear them in that order and Representative Barry has agreed to present them all um, on behalf of the committee. So I will recognize Representative Barry for the purposes of presenting LD 2015, an act to update the comprehensive state energy plan to achieve the state energy vision. Representative Barry. Thank you, Senator Lawrence and uh, fellow members of the committee. Um, as you all know, the state um, should have an energy plan um, and a state energy vision that is clearly articulated. And we have struggled um, over um, the recent history, at least, um, to articulate such a plan. I believe, and I think the committee believes that part of the reason for that is a lack of clarity in our statute about what is envisioned, what is required. It's become a bit of a patchwork. So the uh, bill before us, the committee bill before us would give us the opportunity to wipe the slate clean and articulate some fundamental principles that would be um, involved in such a plan and a vision and some basic processes to make sure that we get there and adjust the plan and the vision as necessary going forward. As you all know, this, the plan is uh, under the stewardship of the governor's energy office and needs to survive the change of uh, political winds and uh, various administrations and various legislatures. So it's important that this be uh, uh, universal set of principles that we can all agree on to the greatest extent possible. The bill as written um, and the committee bill would are, uh, wipe the slate clean um, in uh, repealing current MRSA uh, 9 sub 3 paragraph 3 and enact instead uh, the language that you see before you in the bill um, to establish a comprehensive plan that includes measurable goals, report on the pro state's progress towards meeting those goals, uh, the um, language around consultation with the Efficiency Main Trust Board, just underneath that, um, is consistent with the current uh, statute, um, giving them some input. The plan would need to identify specific goals and strategies, two-year, 10-year, and 30-year goals and recommended strategies to achieve them, benchmarks um, to measure progress towards those goals, and the description of alternative pathways uh, that were considered in developing the goals and strategies should also be articulated, uh, including economic modeling. And I think we've all been very concerned uh, about, you know, costs as we make this transition. So economic modeling uh, is uh, included in this committee bill for that reason. And starting in 2026, uh, the updated state energy plans uh, would include a discussion of the state's progress towards achieving the goals. Changes in benchmarks or methods of measuring success need, would need to be identified and designed to provide consistency 
in understanding where we are, where, we, where we've been, where we're going. And the state energy vision, and here I am on section two of the bill, um, would include the following principles. That total energy costs for the average household in the state should not be higher than for the average household in the US. And average energy costs should decline over time in real dollars. Energy spending in the state is um, directed wherever feasible to economic activity that creates jobs in the state and adds to our state GDP. Greenhouse gas emissions um, should be reduced over time. State energy policies should improve the state's air, soil, and water quality and limit undue environmental or economic harm to other states or regions. On average, energy costs in the state as a portion of household income um, should be as equitable as possible. Reliability is important. Average interruptions of energy supply and de delivery are um, not uh, inconsistent with US averages. Supply and delivery systems um, should be available to all residents of the state to meet their basic needs. And it, um, that consideration should include um, likely and foreseeable weather events. And finally, uh, security, um, all supply and delivery disruptions that could be reasonably anticipated um, from malicious uh, attacks should be anticipated, prevented, minimized. A lot of that work happens already, but um, I think we all can all agree that security is important. So uh, in, in sum, uh, we would have here affordability being put first, uh, job creation being second, reducing greenhouse gases third, uh, fourth, reducing environmental harm of other kinds, uh, fifth, uh, keeping the energy cost burden down, uh, sixth, considering reliability, seventh, considering resiliency, and eighth, and, and finally, uh, security of the grid. So those are the fundamental principles uh, by which the vision would be uh, shaped and, um, and, and stewarded over time if we were to enact this committee bill. And I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Are there other questions from the committee for Representative Barry? Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay, let me bring up my testimony list. Okay, uh, the first people testifying in favor will be Stephen Weems, then we will have James Cody and Dan Burgess testifying either for nor against. So if you could bring over Steve Weems, please. Yeah, um, Mr. Weems said he wouldn't be able to testify on this one, but I'll, I can bring over James Cody and- Okay, thank uh, you. James, uh, Dan Burgess. I can send them. Thank you. Why don't you, I'll go ahead and recognize you and you can introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee. Again, my name is James Cody. I'm employed by Bernstein Shore and I'm here today on behalf of Versant Power, neither for nor against LD 2015. Uh, we have submitted written testimony on this, so I won't belabor those points, but instead I'll just focus briefly on, on two points that we've made in our testimony. Uh, the first is, well, and I will say this unequivocally, I think you've heard us say this a number of times over the last couple of years, that Versa believes very firmly in the power of planning. Uh, we think it's important to engage stakeholders on a variety of different issues, and that there is clear predictable guidance on not only what the state wants uh, 
transmission and distribution utilities to achieve, but also uh, other players in the energy sector um, and, and for everybody to be coordinated. That provides the best possible outcome uh, for consumers and for main people uh, generally. Um, the two points that I would make uh, today are uh, the first being there are a number, as, as you all know, there are a number of directives and studies and plans already being contemplated uh, it, from, te uh, from legislation that has been passed previously, from legislation that is currently being contemplated. Um, and we just think it's very important that any new plan such as this fits into the timing of all of those other plans. We, we certainly appreciate that this plan is a bit more uh, general and directional uh, to an extent, but you know, in LD 1959, uh, there are some planning provisions contained within that. Versen is also uh, in the very early stages of doing some planning around Northern Maine transmission uh, and distribution. And so in order for this uh, to be most effective, we would just suggest that the timing uh, be suited so that it, it, it is as harmonious and effective as possible in terms of achieving results in context of those other plans. Additionally, and my last point for today uh, would be that uh, in section 2.8 regarding the state energy vision, uh, sections 8A and 8F uh, regarding total energy costs and en energy interruptions are proposed to be measured in context of uh, sort of national or national average households. Um, and, and that may be fine, uh, but we would suggest that the plan itself may give policymakers and main people a better look at these desired outcomes if you measure uh, more specifically based on regional average households, um, which as we all know in the Northeast, we are much, uh, much differently situated than many other uh, regions around the country. And that may give you a more precise measurement and vision as to, as to how we stand up in terms of neighboring states uh, in the region. That said, I'd be happy to answer any questions and we'd be more than happy to participate in any discussions about future planning as the committee wishes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the committee for Mr. Cody? Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cody for that comment. Um, just on the regional point, um, any reason not to include uh, the Maritimes in that? I, I'm not aware. I, I don't have specific experience with the Maritimes, but that may be a prudent measurement. I just, I don't have any experience with that, Representative Barry. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Cody? Seeing none, thank you very much. And do we have uh, Mr. Burgess here? Yeah, okay, good afternoon. Go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, present your testimony. Good afternoon, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry and members of the committee. I'm Dan Burgess, I'm the director of the governor's energy office, testifying not for, not against LD uh, 2015. I won't uh, read the testimony that um, has been or will be submitted um, generally. Appreciate the opportunity to um, talk more about um, the state's energy vision. Um, you know, just as a, um, the committee is well aware we, we spent a lot of time in the fall talking about kind of what existing planning initiatives and uh, what was left outstanding and so um, you know do want to um, uh, point to a number of different plans and offices uh, plans and uh, stakeholder groups and reports that have come out of our office recently and we actually just heard that conversation late last year submitted to you all um, within the last couple of hours a 60 plus page document that outlines the overview of um, Kind of a, an energy assessment and overview, which I think uh, utilizes the plans uh, previously done and ongoing work. And then we've been fortunate enough through some uh, uh, funding for new staff to have uh, folks spend quite a bit of time in the Energy Information Administration's database uh, to look at um, available information. So we have this 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 document that we've submitted, as, and then we'll have um, an appendix that goes with it that provides that overview of what's in EIA currently. 
Um, in addition to what we've provided previously in today's report, um, as you know, we have an energy storage report coming to you and then multiple offshore wind studies that are funded through the offshore wind ro roadmap around uh, workforce development and um, energy needs and procurement opportunities. Um, so generally, I also uh, want to flag that uh, the New England Clean Energy Connect stipulation uh, provided $500,000 in funding for a deep decarbonization analysis that the Energy Office is planning to undertake this year. Uh, the stipulation requires that um, we work with the stipulating parties and the broader general public on, uh, on that. And so I uh, uh, plan to move that forward this year. Um, as for what's in the legislation, I, I, I think we've seen the latest. I'll just generally say um, my, we would uh, uh, respectfully would seek some um, fine tuning of some of the energy vision as, as it's laid out and would wanna work, work through that with, with the sponsor and, and committee should there be an opportunity to do that. And then just to flag that um, two other things. One is that the uh, iteration of how this would work with the Climate Council reports and wanting to make sure that um, I do think there's a, a, an opportunity for there not to come at the same time. The next climate action plan is due 2024 and having it come before or after 2024 might be helpful um, and, and kind of having different, um, uh, different processes moving forward. And then finally, depending on the, the breadth and depth of uh, a, a study, the, you know, the energy office uh, um, will in likely have access to federal funding, but that may not always be the case depending on, you know, um, uh, what's happening. And so an opportunity to uh, have federal funding, uh, to have uh, an access to a funding source would be needed, I think, if, we're, if there's going to be particularly multiple pathways and scenarios and uh, economic analysis that comes with, with it. We've learned from our previous studies that um, that in-depth modeling and economic analysis can um, is, is something where consultant help is needed. And um, we just want to con consider how many scenarios, do 20, 30, 20, 40, 20, 50, multiple pathways, economic analysis, it, it, it could get pricey. So with that, I appreciate the uh, consideration and uh, look forward to uh, working with you should this bill move forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the committee for Director Burgess? Representative Grahowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and good afternoon now, Mr. Burgess. Um, question I had for you that we discussed last fall, I believe, was the timing, and you mentioned sort of the, the year timing, but um, we had talked about maybe having the report come like in the mid to late fall to sort of be available for interested legislators to use to inform their pre-culture It'll work. Um, is there any reason that that seems like it wouldn't work well for you guys? And we could think about what that means for the first one, but you know, after those ones, um, the updates, does, does that seem doable? Is there any reason that would be better or worse for you than January 15th? I appreciate that uh, question, Representative, and I should have noted in my testimony, we're also suggesting that we move our annual report out to March 15th to match some of the other, I think the OPAs is now, is now that time. Um, as for the, I, I don't see, you know, the timing of the first one, right? Like I think is, is would be the important consideration, um, but I don't see, you know, kind of as it moves forward, there being a difference between, you know, a, a date in the fall and, and January. Um, I guess the only thing I, I might flag is just the, the timing of the standard offer. Um, and right now that currently comes out in, um, in November or, or kind of, but I, I'm not sure that would be a reason not to have it due in the fall. Um, and I guess I, I should also note we in the report that you have and what we're posting online, the EIA information is through 2019. And so they have not produced 2020 or 2021 information. It's not usually um, available kind of directly after the year, but that does take some time. Um, and usually they do it late in the year, but I, generally I don't see a reason why fall wouldn't work. Other questions for Mr. Burgess? Seeing none, thank you very much. And I don't see anybody Rep else. Rep Foster had his hand up. Excuse me? Rep Foster oh, had was, his hand up. I was trying to ignore him. Uh, Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I am ignorable. Uh, thank you, Mr. Burgess. Very briefly, I'll try to stay brief on this. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if you would comment on whether you see this uh, uh, 
legislation is as helpful, uh, maybe a little restrictive, too directive, or duplicative of what uh, your office is already doing. Uh, I'm just looking at it from the point of view that it may or may not be needed to uh, to continue uh, your work. Thank you. Thanks, Representative. I appreciate the question. Um, General, I think it's always helpful to have you know the the UT committee kind of provide overall policy direction. You know, we value that obviously and the work that we're doing and try to be as responsive to it as we can be. I mean, I think, um, as I mentioned, we are going to be undertaking this this additional analysis with a with the stakeholder group, and there is other work happening. Um, I think that what I would flag is just the um, the timing of that, and then the um, you know kind of some of the modifications in the state energy vision that would that would probably be useful along with funding. So I, I, I'm not sure I necessarily see it as um, you know it, always helpful to hear from the committee one way or the other. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Burgess. Uh, I believe this is it for the testimony on this bill. <coughs> Senator Lawrence, you have um, yeah. you have Steve Hudson and the and the attendees. Uh, he's, oh, he's, I don't see him signed up to testify. Did he want to testify? He 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 does. He, yes. Okay. Why don't you bring him over? and uh, we'll ask him to testify. <clears throat> Steve, why don't you go right ahead? Thank you very much, Senator Lawrence. <clears throat> Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee. I am once again, Stephen Hudson, um, uh, with Pretty Flaherty here on behalf of the Industrial Energy Consumer Group, speaking either for or against LD 2015. Um, I just, I think the, uh, we would echo um, uh, the GEOs um, in, in the sense that we are willing to be involved in uh, uh, the fleshing out of the vision piece of, of the state energy vision um, that, uh, uh, Representative Barry went through. There are some tensions that are contained within those aspirations. They're all they're all very good aspirations, but I, I think it's important to recognize that some of them um, may be difficult, uh, if uh, or very expensive, or difficult and very expensive uh, to achieve. Doesn't mean we shouldn't have them in our vision, but we should be clear-eyed about what that may mean. Um, and you know. Uh, one example is uh, in E, um, uh, sa stating that household energy costs in the state as a portion of household income um, are equitable across all income levels. Um, that's clearly a, good, a, a great aspiration to have. Um, it becomes difficult because it means that since you have people with different income levels and it's got to be equitable, you, you've got to have um, you've got to have uh, different energy cost levels um, for, for the lower income folks so that it matches. And, and I'm not sure what that means, whether it's a, sh a shifting of pricing based on income or not, but it's important to think about um, as you think about the wording of adopting it as a vision. Um, I think, you know, G is also, I'm sorry, that's item G, uh, uh, that, you know, the capable of functioning independently of regular supply um, and delivery system for prolonged periods. Uh, it's easy to do that by giving everybody, a, you know, uh, a, uh, a large generator and, you know, a couple gallons of, of fuel. Um, but I think what's intended there is that we do something that is, that, uh, is something else. We've had a lot, the committee has worked a lot on microgrids, but I don't know that that's necessarily what's entailed here, but I think you know, uh, I think some of these visions could uh, uh, could benefit from some additional thought, and we're glad to be a part of that. And I want to thank the committee for their time today. It's been a very long day for you, even though it's uh, uh, and it's um, and you've got more work to do, and and uh, we'll do whatever we can to assist you. Uh, glad to answer any questions. Great. Are there questions for Mr. Hudson from the committee, Representative Barry? 
Thank you, Mr. Reds. I just want to say I, I um, concur with the, you know, the the difficulty of, you know, holding all these values at once. And I think um, the question is just, uh, you know, do, do you think it's it's appropriate that in, in forming a vision um, that we keep in mind that it's it's just that it's a vision. It's where we hope to get to. Um, but, uh, you know, a North, a North Star, if you will, um, but that a vision is different from uh, an objective or a strategy. Uh, I think it's, it's interesting because uh, I haven't done the research on how a, vision, a state vision is different than a state goal versus a state uh, mandate. Yeah. And uh, there, are, there is actually case law around that um, that can be surprising to folks. Um, but I, I, I'm not suggesting at all the state not, a, not have a vision. I think it's, it's good to know where you want to go when you start thinking about how you're going to get there. Um, so I think that that's important, but I think it, we need, I just, I just think that um, we need to recognize some of the inherent tensions and think about what that's going to mean and, um, and think about whether we intend these to be to become mandates on our uh, agencies that are trying to carry out what the legislature has directed them to do. Thank you. Representative Barry, did you want to follow up? All set. Okay. Other questions from the committee? I don't see any, so thank you very much for coming over, Mr. Hudson. Thank you. So I'll declare this hearing on 2-15-2015. Uh, closed. We'll go on to our next bill, which is 2016. It is also going to be presented by uh, Representative Barry. And I'll go directly to him and he can present the bill. Thank you, Senator Lawrence, members of the committee. Uh, I am Seth Barry presenting. Um, this committee bill, LD 2016, an act to implement the crisis response services recommendations identified pursuant to resolve 2021, chapter 29. It is my hope that the sponsor of that resolve will join us shortly and can speak in more detail uh, to the value of this committee bill. Uh, but I will, um, direct you to the summary and um, the bill as written there requires the PUC to include developments in the delivery of crisis response services in the commission's annual report to the legislature. Uh, it defines crisis response services as services offered to individuals experiencing mental health emergencies, emergencies relating to substance use disorder or other emergencies for which fire emergency medical or police services are determined not to be required. The bill further directs the PUC Emergency Services Communication Bureau in consultation with the Department of Public Safety to develop proposed legislation to implement the Bureau's protocol and procedure recommendations for the delivery of crisis response services. And the Bureau must allow affected persons and entities to provide comments on the proposal the proposed legislation and comments must be submitted to this committee in the next legislature in the uh, uh, first regular session, uh, 2023, uh, for that committee to consider reporting out legislation uh, pursuant to the report. And again, um, I think we may have with us the sponsor, it looks like we do now have with us the sponsor of the resolve that led to this committee bill, Representative Morales. So um, I would be happy to defer any questions to her unless you insist on directing them to me. Great, thank you. Does anybody insist on directing questions to Representative Barry? Seeing none, I'll recognize um, Representative Morales for the purposes of testifying on this bill. Hello, Senator Lawrence. Hello, Representative Barry and the UT committee. It's great to see you all. Um, I just want to say um, and to express extreme gratitude to you, um, to this committee for taking on this effort and this uh, legislative initiative. 
I can't tell you how wonderful it has been to work with the PUC and uh, Director Jacques and Brody Hinckley um, and the stakeholders who came together uh, to study the issue um, throughout our state. You heard the report back. I'm sure you were as impressed as I was about that. Um, and as you all know, and you don't need to hear it too much from me, but this bill is so important because E911 is at the very beginning of our response to crisis. And so having everyone in the room to identify that not all crisis calls need to go to police, that some need a behavioral health or in a mental health crisis response, and to figure out that pathway of how to get there. Um, is why this bill was so important and this working group was so important. So I just wanna add one um, suggestion uh, as I look at who is going to be on the working group. Um, I noticed that there are no community mental health providers or a representative from the mental health crisis system. So I respectfully would make that suggestion that we add um, a, a community mental health provider and a representative of the mental health crisis system. And those folks would add to that conversation in that working group of who do we refer calls to then? As we're collaborating with 988 system, um, which I give great credit to Dr. Pollard over at the Office of Behavioral Health for bringing in stakeholders around that initiative. Um, who then are those folks who are responding to these crises? So I'd be happy to take any questions, but I just really want to thank this committee for the work you did. Thank you for, uh, for coming to testify. Is there anyone who has a question for Representative Morales? Seeing none, thank you very much. And we'll go on to the last person, I believe, who's going to be testifying on this legislation, who is uh, Maria Jakes from the uh, Public Utilities Commission. Is Maria here, Jason? Yes, uh, she should be over shortly. Thank you. All right. Maria, why don't you um, go ahead? Good afternoon, Senator uh, Lawrence, Representative Barry, and other members of the Joint Standing Committee on the Energy Utilities and Technology. My name is Maria Jakes, and I'm director of the Enhanced 911 program that's housed within the Public Utilities Commission. And I'm here on behalf of the commission to, to offer our support for um, this LD as amended by Representative Barry. Um, so the commission appreciates the direction the amendment takes thoughtfully move towards the implementation of behavioral health protocols. And while we have undertaken a lot of stakeholder conversations, there are still so many more that need to occur before commencing implementation. And as behavioral health protocols are still in their early stages of development, this approach provides additional time for the industry to mature. Sections one and two of the resolve establish a working group to develop policies and procedures to address the screening and transferring of calls for behavioral health services. The formation of such a group is actually one of the recommendations included in our crisis protocol report. It is a way to re, uh, reduce the risk exposure for all agencies involved in crisis response. In addition to the development of critical policies and procedures, this group will assist with the change management process of this significant paradigm shift for public safety by having a role in the development of policy, as well as having the ability to share information with their respective constituencies. Section three of the resolve directs the commission in consultation with the Department of Public Safety to develop proposed legislation to implement the, the protocol um, the recommendations of the crisis services report. Um, and we will also have the benefit of this time uh, of the discussions of the working group established in sections one and two of the resolve. 
And lastly, we've learned a lot of lessons from the prior implementation of protocols, and you've heard, or you've heard about those lessons many times. And we believe this strategy is the best way to move towards the implementation of behavioral health protocols. The commission appreciates having this additional time to engage stakeholders, develop important policies and procedures, and to draft legislation in a cooperative manner. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions and I'd certainly be available for the work session. Great, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Jakes. Are there questions from the committee? Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Jakes. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we've learned from other attempts to in initiate protocols that uh, uh, it's good to get a buy-on from those that uh, are involved stakeholder groups in this case, uh, I think is what you're referring to. I just wanna confirm that uh, basically this will lead to future legislation that uh, we will uh, be looking at uh, and that this won't be something that just takes effect by rule. And the reason I mentioned that is I, I was a little surprised to see, uh, and I know that this late in the game, uh, a lot of people don't get a heads up on these things, but I was surprised not to see some of the uh, usual suspects, if you will, that might be here to uh, to speak in favor or against this. So I'm just assuming that uh, that's not necessary until some legislation may be brought forward from your group. Is that the case? Would you? Am I reading that right? Right. I believe Section Three asks us to report back with legislation, and then the committee would have that opportunity to move it forward as an LD, and there would be time for public comment. And certainly, even though you know we name certain people in this group, all are welcome. I just think that um, the representation needed uh, to be spelled out uh, a little bit more, um, just to make sure we have all the right players there. But as many as want to come, we'd be happy to hear from. Thank you. Great. Are you all set, Representative Foster? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Representative Grahowski. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Ms. Jax, for being here. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, Representative Morales mentioned including in that list, which you said is not exhaustive, and I think that's a good design for it, but explicitly including a community ment mental health provider and somebody um, representing the mental health crisis system, system. Are those things that um, seem reasonable to you to add to the list to just make sure we have that covered for sure? Absolutely, that is a very reasonable request. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Do you prefer Jax or Jakes? Jakes. Jakes, thank you. That's okay. I any, other, any other uh, questions for Ms. Jakes? Seeing none, thank you very much. Jason, is there anybody else interested in testifying on this bill? Uh, yes, there's a Stephen Bunker I would like to. Okay, Testify. we have uh, Stephen come over. I believe he's from Farmington. Stephen, uh, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you, Welcome. Senator. And if you could just introduce yourself, tell us where you're from and if you're representing any organization. Surely. I'm Stephen Bunker. I reside in Farmington. I'm a member of the uh, Bureau's E911 Advisory uh, Council. Um, I'm also a 43-year first responder and would be a likely participant and beneficiary of this piece of legislation should it come through. I'm, uh, I'm speaking only for myself and not, not affiliated with, with anyone out, uh, outside of the, the council itself. And I, I just want to add my, my brief support in uh, for the momentum that's pushed behind this particular LD. It is, uh, it is absolutely an essential component of both public safety and, and our mental health crisis systems here in, in Maine. And uh, I, I just want to strongly urge that the committee that with the anticipated adoption of protocols by statute in the, in the, in the next session, this may be all for naught if we don't adequately support the creation and expansion of Maine's uh, mental health and crisis services that these pro uh, protocols are intended to offer our police and uh, EMS responders. And 
it's the lack of such uh, alternatives. It's the 800 pound gorilla in the room on this. So uh, I'm sure that you're staying in contact with your colleagues such as uh, in health and human services and appropriations committees uh, to put the effort behind actually getting these resources expanded there that, that uh, our PSAPs can actually make referrals uh, out to. And after considering the significant changes that are gonna take place uh, and the impact upon our, our PSAPs, I'm gonna strongly recommend that the committee offers some, some small relief to the centers in advance of this implementation. And uh, with the addition of all of the protocols that we have and for all the right reasons and the related quality assurance requirements, I strongly urge the committee to support uh, the use of third party quality assurance services for those centers who are so inclined to receive that type of support. And I'm aware there's several centers in Maine that have already started down that trail, and, uh, but, but sadly at their own cost in, uh, in doing that. So uh, never in the beginning of 911, and I go back to day one on this, did we uh, anticipate what kind of burden, not only the protocols, but quality assurance call reviews we're going to be placing upon the, the PSAPs and affecting their local budgets and the draw upon their local local staff uh, without without support. So um, I would tell you as a municipal representative, uh, using our surcharge funds uh, for these kinds of services would be a considerable property tax relief to towns and counties that are that are struggling with their, with their revenue. So it would reduce the workload of key staff on doing the routine call reviews. And we heard from the stakeholder groups, these centers are already struggling with uh, retention and recruitment and are short staffed in most of the centers. We heard that clearly in their, uh, in their, in their testimony. So uh, I would hope we could consider QA continuing to be an essential component of how protocols are used and it's directly related to 911 center operations, and we could use surcharge dollars as a legitimate expense, and it deserves to be a funded rather than an unfunded uh, mandate. And I'm reminded this isn't a new topic. Uh, for those few members who have been around on the committee, uh, back in 2011 and 2012, the same uh, great consulting firm, Mission, Mission Critical, came out with two comprehensive reports on how to manage and operate our center. And they brought that out over a decade uh, ago as an essential element uh, to help relieve the, the uh, pressures that applies, uh, uh, applies to the, uh, the PSATs them, uh, themselves. So there are a lot of uh, recommendations out of those two reports that I would encourage us to look at again and perhaps be a part of included in the PUC's next annual report on what had been recommended what had been implemented and what's still waiting there uh, for, uh, for consideration. So um, I look forward to working with the stakeholder group and I'm pleased to respond to any questions from the committee that you might have. Thank you. Are there questions from the committee for Mr. Foster? Bunker, I'm sorry. That's quite all right. Just, I was just anticipating who might have a question. Seeing no questions, thank you very much, Mr. Bunker. And that concludes our um, Senator, testimony. Senator oh, Lawrence. Sorry, Representative Grohowski, did you have a question? I think uh, Jason was about to address it. Yeah, Jason? Yeah, there's a, there's a Sam Hurley that would like to um, testify as well. Okay, why don't you bring Mr. Hurley over? Okay, uh, Sam, why don't you go ahead, introduce yourself, um, where you're from and what organization you represent, if any, and then present your testimony. Good afternoon, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology. My name is Sam Hurley and I'm the Director of Maine Emergency Medical Services or Maine EMS within the Department of Safety. We are the over, uh, we provide oversight to PSAPs and emergency medical dispatch centers throughout the state of Maine. I am testifying on behalf of the Maine Department of Public Safety and Maine EMS in support of Representative Barry's proposed amendment to LD 2016. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. I don't know that we need to 
beat a dead horse at this point, but I did want to offer our support of this resolve. Um, we think it's an integral part to continuing the system, but I did want to offer Maine EMS's support of this resolve. Great, are there questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. Jason, is there anybody else who wants to testify? I don't believe so. Okay. If you could uh, beam Mr. Bunker and um, the other attendee back across. We, I think there's been a request uh, for the committee to go into work session and work this bill before uh, we hear the next bill. So I'll recognize Representative Barry for that purpose. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that we go into work session on this bill. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Representative Kessler. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Show of hands. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, we're in work session. Um, so I see Eloise, are you there? I think we have seven. Um, so I think we're good to uh, have a vote. Uh, Representative Barry, did you want to make a motion? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move this bill out to pass as amended with the amendment being what was recommended by the sponsor of the original resolve, Representative Morales, uh, regarding additional participants in the stakeholder group. Great, it's been moved out to pass as amended. Is there a second? Second. And who was that? By Representative Kessler. Okay, it's been seconded by Representative Kessler. Uh, debater discussion? Okay, um, Jason, why don't you take the roll? Senator Lawrence. Yes. Senator Lawrence is yes. Senator Vitelli. Sorry, just catching up here, yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart, uh, present. Representative Barry. Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy. Representative Cuddy is not present. Representative Grahowski. Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler. Yes. Representative Kessler is a yes. Representative Ziegler. Yes. Representative Ziegler is a yes. Representative Sachs. Uh, present. Representative Wadsworth. Aye. Representative Wadsworth is a yes or an aye. Representative Greg Non is not present. Representative Foster. Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. Representative Carlo. Not present. That is eight in favor and five absent. Okay, eight uh, voting in favor, being a majority. That will be the majority report on to pass as amended, and we'll see what the other ones want to vote. And I just want to thank you, Jason, for promoting Representative Foster to a senator, too, as well. I'm sure today is his day in, in, uh, in being promoted to a senator. Looking for the pay increase. Yeah, it's large. It's very large. Okay. Uh, we're on to our final bill, and I'll go to Representative Barry again to present LD-2017. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Lawrence, members of the committee, um, Seth Barry, and uh, here to present LD-2017, a resolve regarding monitoring of and reporting on energy use data standards and online energy data platforms. Um, this bill also uh, it comes out, or this resolve, I should say, also comes out of some previous work by the committee. It would direct the governor's energy office to monitor efforts undertaken in other states to, um, excuse me, I, am I looking at the right bill? Yeah, I just needed to double check. Yes, okay. <laughs> it's late in the day, I apologize. Uh, uh, directs the GEO to monitor efforts undertaken in other states to improve energy use data standards and to implement multiple use online energy data, data platforms. And on or before November 2 of this year, 
uh, submit inf information regarding uh, those efforts to this committee uh, and the committee in the, uh, the next legislature, the one for 31st in 2023, may report out related legislation. Uh, and finally, the resolve also requires the UC to issue an, R an RFI, request for information, to utilities in the state, transmission and distribution utilities, uh, and to report the results of the request to the committee. Um, and uh, the committee, again, can report out legislation on that. Uh, this uh, issue also comes to us because of the work of another uh, legislator and um, he is with us. Um, I'm, I'm referring, of course, to Representative Kessler. So, I, you know, I um, am happy to defer any um, challenging technical questions to him, unless you insist on directing them to me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does um, anyone have a question for Representative Barry? And Jason, has uh, Representative Kessler signed up to testify? Uh, not that I can see. Okay. Representative Kessler, uh, do you want to testify on this bill? I would be glad to say a few words, if that's okay, Mr. Chair. That would be great. Okay, thank you. Uh, of course, my name is uh, Representative Chris Kessler, representing Fire of South Portland, Smidgen of Cape Elizabeth. Um, as, as you are familiar with before, uh, this is the report out from that study, uh, the, the request for information that the PUC underwent. And these really were the uh, three key items that were very actionable items to get the further information that we need to uh, mm -hmm. move along with uh, uh, grid planning as well as um, uh, creating at least a universal data um, standard <clears throat> that all utilities are able to uh, export their data to. So it really is a matter of putting that request out to the utilities to, to understand where they're at in their ability to do so, what it would cost ratepayers to do so. Um, and yeah, just moving along in that process. So that Great. concludes there, my testimony. Are there questions from the committee for Representative Kessler? Seeing none, we have two people signed up to testify, uh, Melissa Winnie and I believe it's Harry Lanfear. Um, so if you could bring them over in that order, uh, that would be great. So I'll recognize you first, Melissa. And you're gonna be testifying in favor, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Great, well, thank you, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee. My name is Melissa Winnie. I'm an energy policy advisor for the governor's energy office, uh, testifying today in support of LD 2017. Um, Representative Barry gave a great overview of what this legislation will do, so I'll keep my testimony short and sweet here. Um, the GEO were supportive of moving forward with monitoring and providing a staff report that summarizes efforts undertaken in other states to improve energy use data standards and to implement multiple use online data platforms. Um, based on this information, the report may include potential recommendations for Maine. Uh, additionally, we support section two um, which directs the PUC to collect information from Maine's t and utilities regarding their current abilities related to establishment of a multiple use online energy data platform, uh, including information around projected costs to achieve certain abilities they may not currently have. I just wanna um, ensure that it's noted that we recognize that data access is a key component to accomplishing the state's clean energy and climate requirements. And we do think that this, um, these reports would provide information that could be really helpful in informing future policy making and or platform design moving forward. So thank you for your time and consideration. Happy to take any questions. 
Great. Are there questions from the committee for Ms. Winnie? Seeing none, thank you. And we'll go on to Harry Lamphere, who's going to be testifying, I believe, neither for nor against. Harry? Good afternoon. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you fine. Excellent. Thank you, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and members of the committee. I am Harry Lanfier. I'm the Administrative Director at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, and we are testifying either for or against. Uh, just a couple quick comments. So the resolve requires us to collect um, specific data from transmission and distribution utilities first, whether the utility can map specific meters to specific buildings, and if not, what would the cost be to ratepayers um, required to do that? And then secondly, whether the utility can export export data using certain formats detailed in the resolve. If not, the processing cost payers to achieve that um, ability to export that data. So, and then finally, as was noted, uh, there's a report due on November 2nd. So uh, just a couple kind of clarifying questions that maybe could be answered in work session, but um, your call. So um, the, the original report that we did um, that was provided to the committee on January 20th um, requested information from vendors, but it, it requested information regarding the two investor-owned electric utilities, transmission and distribution utilities, and the four LDCs, the four gas companies, so those six entities. So we just wanted clarification. Um, did you just want the electric TNDs, and did you want, want both IOU and COU? That was one area where we were looking for some clarification from the committee. And then secondly, in, in the fourth paragraph of our testimony, uh, just um, asking again, some additional clarification uh, based on our understanding of the green button standards and, and how they work, um, whether you would want um, the specific detail data that, that has been elaborated in, in my testimony. And again, I'm not sure it needs to be answered right now, but the more clarification, I, I guess, you know, we just want to make absolute sure that when we're collecting this data from the utilities, we get exactly what you're looking for. You know, we want to give you give you a report back that is um, this, that, you know, gets at these issues. So, again, just seeking a little bit more clarification there. And then finally, I can't speak for any of these utilities that that are going to be involved. Uh, I have I have no sense whatsoever. Um, of costs that might be involved here. And I certainly have no sense how long it would take to estimate those costs. Um, so because, because of that unknown, um, it might be better to extend the report deadline out a little bit to provide utilities um, the, the time to come up with the estimates um, to, to uh, have the report due at the end of January versus the, the first of November, but obviously that's the committee's call. So with that, I we're, we'll, we'll be available for work session. I can answer any questions if need be. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions from the committee for Mr. Lamphere? Representative Kessler and then Representative Wadsworth. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Harry. Um, I was wondering just as a matter of procedure, um, so, for example, when a um, when a resolve requires like the opening of a docket and um, uh, information needs to be uh, received by the utilities, for example, I'm thinking about the grid modernization docket, and there's been a, a request for extensions to provide information. Could that very well happen in this case as well? I, I certainly possible. Obviously, would we would ask for the data um, in advance to give us enough time to write the report. Uh, I, I'm just, you know, a, a little bit concerned that the cost data might take. And again, it depends on which utility. If you're talking about CPM, they might be able to turn that data around fairly quick. Although I'm not certain of that. Smaller utilities might might struggle to do that. Um, so, so again, I, we just wanted to raise the issue. You know, if it's important to get the report done th early November, then you know, 
so so be it. We'll we'll get the best data we can that the utilities can provide to us at with that timing in mind. Does that answer your question, Kessler? Any follow up? Okay, Representative Wadsworth. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. So what is, what is green button data or green button connect? What, what does that mean to you? I, I guess I don't understand what that is. Yeah, it's, a, it's an industry standard that, that um, most of the country is going to, to transfer, transfer this type of data. Um, and then that data, if it's, once it's transferred using that standard, then it can be captured by another software and you can slice it and dice it any way you want uh, to make it more functional for, you know, a, a business's needs or a community's needs um, so they can evaluate, you know, energy efficiency or maybe greenhouse gas initiatives, et cetera. So is this data that we're expecting uh, COUs and IOUs to have, or is this something that more IOUs would, would have? Yeah, that was actually that was one of our questions. Um, I, I know we 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 have a sense of um, TMP and Versant capability here, but um, I, I don't really have a sense, at least me personally. Maybe other people at the PUC do of, of what the COU capability would be in this area. Anything further, Representative Wadsworth? No, that's good. Just trying to understand. I appreciate yep. it. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Lamfair? Seeing none, thank you very much, Harry. Um, Jason, is there anybody else who wants to testify on this bill? There's no one that I've been notified of. Okay, great. So I'll declare Representative Barry. Uh, I was gonna make a motion after you declare the public hearing to be concluded. Okay. I'll declare the public hearing closed. Um, is the motion, your motion gonna be to go into work session? That would be the motion. Okay, so it'd be my intent, I have to head out. Um, so it'd be my intent if we do go into work session to uh, turn the chair over to you and I'll just listen in. Um, okay. So is there a second to that motion? Second to that. I'm actually by going to Kessler, did you want to withdraw your motion? I think I'd like to withdraw the motion unless Senator Vitelli or Senator Stewart can join us because we do need a senator to proceed with a work session. Um, so Senator see. Vitelli, she is there. Okay. Great. I'm here. I have bad internet, so I'll do my best. The motion is to go into work session. Um, a show of hands who is in favor of going into work session. Representative Wadsworth? No, not sure. Okay. Four. Did I get three or four? Three to go into work. Four. Let me count again. Okay. Everybody hold up their hands. Who's in favor of work session? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. And how many are in favor of a nap? But yes on that also. <laughs> okay, it looks like seven to zero. Uh, we're gonna have a work session and I'm gonna go take a nap. So I, I sorry, I have to go get my daughter. Um, so um, Representative Barry, if you could take over, that would be great. Very good, thank you. Thank have you. Good afternoon. And we are now in work session on LD uh, 2017. Um, is there motion or a need for information? I'll, I'll, what's the committee's pleasure? So leave it open for either. Representative Kessler. Uh, I just wanted to address uh, some of the questions from the PUC first. Sounds good. Do you need them back in or do you just want to speak to them? I, well, I, Yes, bring them back in, please, if you would. Okay, Jason, could we bring in Mr. Lanfear again? He should be on his way over. Great. Okay. 
I think he's there. Just there he is. Um, so uh, I suppose uh, so, uh, Mr. Interfere. I was just wanting to clarify your second question uh, about the green button standard. You said what uh, you wanted to. Um, clarify what would it take to provide access to data? Could you just sort of restate that question or concern? Sure. We Basically, we, we were just seeking clarity from the wording from the resolve, which I have in front of me, but it's, it's hard to hold, hold my smartphone and multitask here. You guys are more talented at that than I am. But so the, the, that wording that you see in our testimony was just to make sure that we understood exactly uh, the data and the capability you were looking for. And I think, I think we're clear on it, but um, again, those two kind of questions in paragraph four were just our attempt to elaborate a little bit on what we think you meant in, from the resolve. So, it, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, what you're, you want to know from the utilities, what specifically would it take to export the data um, to using that standard and then, um, what would it take to provide access to that that data through that standard? I, I think that's what you're getting at in the resolve. But again, I just, and again, you, you don't have to answer it now. You could go back to folks if you need to, but we just wanted to make sure at the end of the day, when we do our report that you've, you've got exactly what you need. Um, so to, that didn't answer your question maybe in detail, but hopefully it's helpful. Uh Yes, uh, really, essentially, it is just about the ability to take their existing data and, and export it. Um, what, what happens beyond that point? I don't think uh, that question is needing answering at this juncture, um, but just purely the ability for them to take that existing data set and transfer it over and export to the green button data. So. Uh, that that was the specific ask there. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Yep. Um, and uh, really, the intent of the report back date was so we could address it in the first regular session of the 131st, and and have time to um, uh, hash it over. So um, that that was the intent. Um, so I would imagine that, uh, if it is onerous for the utilities, I was hoping that they, they might have flagged that here. So, um, nobody's expressed, uh, concerns about that. So, um, I didn't imagine it to be a concern. Um, and then uh, just for clarification too, yes, this, this was intending on including the COUs and the natural gas utilities. So as everybody is, you know, uh, moving towards electrification and as municipalities are trying to like set their own benchmarking ordinances and such um, that, you know, everybody's gotta be involved. So that was the intent. Okay. Yeah, it would be helpful. Maybe, maybe your motion could clarify that if you're if you're going to move this. Uh, be helpful to clarify that um, for us. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Great, okay, Representative Kessler. Any other discussion or a motion? Yes, um, I just wanted to uh, make it clear uh, to the committee that there's not going to be any costs incurred by this resolve. Uh, it's purely the next step in information gathering. So um, when when they report back, we will finally get that estimate of cost. So, and um, I can take any questions if anybody has any, otherwise I would be glad to make a motion. All right, I'll just stop and see if there's any discussion uh, or questions for anyone present who's testified or been involved in this work. Okay, is the committee ready for a motion? Is there a motion? Mr. Chair. 
Representative Kessler. Uh, I would like to uh, motion uh, ought to pass as amended, uh, um, clarifying in the language, uh, the inclusion of the natural gas utilities and uh, consumer owned utilities. Okay, uh, there's been a motion uh, about to pass as amended with that minor clarification. Is there a second? Seconded by Senator Vitelli. I second Any it. discussion? Any discussion? All right, seeing none, we will proceed to a vote on the Antipas amended motion for this resolve. And I'll ask the committee clerk to call the roll. Senator Lawrence is not present. Senator Vitelli? Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart? Not present. Representative Barry? Yes. Senator Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy? Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski? Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler? Of course, yes. Representative Kessler is a yes. Representative Ziegler? Yes. Representative Ziegler is a yes. Representative Sachs? Yes. Representative Sachs is a yes. Representative Wadsworth? Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Representative Grignon? Not present. Representative Foster? Not present. Representative Carlo? Not present. That is eight in favor of the motion and five absent. Thank you. Jason, so uh, with eight in favor and five absent, the motion carries. Will others will vote on this in our previous uh, work sessions um, as per usual. Uh, there is no session tomorrow. Stay tuned for updates from the chairs and or analysts about any changes to our calendar. Uh, Lindsay, is there anything else from you? Uh, the only thing I wanted to flag is that I sent out an email to the committee with information regarding the budget discussions. Um, so if you could please look that over and get back to me by uh, noon tomorrow, tomorrow's the deadline. Um, so I plan on getting that out promptly. So thank you for know. flagging that. Thank you. All right, seeing no other business um, advertised or brought before the committee today, uh, I would be happy to entertain a motion to adjourn. Representative Kessler. Uh, before we adjourn, I just wanted to um, say an unrelated note to those who uh, didn't see the news, but the U.S. Senate passed uh, to adopt permanent daylight savings time. I hope you saw it, but uh, it's been a thing of mine since I started in the legislature. I just wanted to share my joy. So, Congratulations, uh, Representative to Kessler. Adjourn. Remember, there there are other uh, other steps that needs to take before it gets all the way there. Right? It's a big um, one. It is. No, you should be you should be very uh, very proud of that. And I, for one, hope they go all the way. Uh, it's been moved to adjourn. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Wadsworth and Representative Sachs. And any debate or discussion? Actually, that's non debatable. So we'll go to a vote. All those in favor? And we are adjourned. See you all soon. Thanks, everybody.